the poverty of theory or an orary of errors by E.P. Thompson. Disciples do own unto masters only a temporary belief and a suspension of their own judgment until they be fully instructed and not an absolute resignation or perpetual captivity. So let great authors have their due, as time, which is the author of authors, be not deprived of his due, which is further and further to discover truth. That was a quote from Francis Bacon. Reason, or the ratio of all we have already known, is not the same that it shall be when we know more. That was a quote from William Blake. 1. For some time, for many decades, the materialist conception of history the first-born intellectual child of Marx and Engels, has been growing in self-confidence. As a mature practice, historical materialism, it is perhaps the strongest discipline deriving from the Marxist tradition. Even in my own lifetime as a historian, and in the work of my own compatriots, the advances have been considerable, and one had supposed these to be advances in knowledge. This is not to say that this knowledge is finite or subject to some proof of positivistic scientism, nor is it to suppose that the advance has been unilinear and unproblematic. Sharp disagreements exist and complex problems remain not only unsolved, but scarcely even disclosed. It is possible that the very success of historical materialism as a practice has encouraged a conceptual lethargy which is now bringing down upon our heads its necessary revenge. And this is the more possible in those parts of the English-speaking world, where a vigorous practice of historical materialism has been conducted within an inherited empirical idiom of discourse, which is reproduced by strong educational and cultural traditions. All of this is possible, even probable. Even so, the case should not be overstated. For what a philosopher, who is only a casual acquaintance with historical practice, may glance at and then dismiss with a ferocious scowl as empiricism, may in fact be the result of arduous confrontations, pursued both in conceptual engagements, the definition of appropriate questions, the elaboration of hypotheses, and the exposure of ideological attributions in pre-existing historiography and also in the interstices of historical method itself. And the Marxist historiography, which now has an international presence, has contributed significantly not only to its own self-criticism and maturation in theoretical ways, but also to imposing by repeated controvers controversies much arduous intellectual labor in some polemic. Its presence upon orthodox historiography imposing, in Althusser's sense, its own, or Marx's, problematic upon significant areas of historical inquiry. Engaged in these confrontations, we had, I suppose, neglected our lines of theoretical supply, but in the moment when we seemed to be poised for further advances, we have been suddenly struck from the rear, and not from a rear of manifest bourgeois ideology, but from a rear claiming to be more Marxist than Marx. From the quarter of Louis Althusser and his numerous followers, there has been launched an unmeasured assault upon historicism. The advances of historical materialism, its supposed knowledge, have rested, it turns out, upon one slender and rotten epistemological pillar, empiricism. When Althusser submitted this pillar to a stern interrogation, it shuddered and crumbled to dust and the whole enterprise of historical materialism collapsed in ruins around it. Not only does it turn out that men have never made their own history at all, but it is also revealed that the enterprise of historical materialism, the attainment of historical knowledge, has been misbegotten from the start, since real history is unknowable and cannot be said to exist. In the words of two post-Althusserians, whose merit it is to have carried Althusserian logic to its own reductio ad absurdum, history is condemned by the nature of its object to empiricism. But empiricism, as we know, is a disreputable manifestation of bourgeois ideology, 
despite the empiricist claims of historical practice, the real object of history is inaccessible to knowledge. It follows that Marxism as a theoretical and a political practice gains nothing from its association with historical writing and historical research. The study of history is not only scientifically, but also politically valueless. The project to which many lifetimes in successive generations have been given is thus exposed as an illusion, if innocent, and something worse, if not. And yet historical materialists of my own generation have been slow to acknowledge their own abject exposure. They go on working in their old reprobate ways. Some are too busy to have read the indictments entered against them, but those who have appear to have reacted in one of two ways. Many have glanced at the antagonist in a casual way, seeing it as a weird apparition, a freak of intellectual fashion, which, if they close their eyes, will in time go away. They may be right in the first assumption that Althusserian Marxism is an intellectual freak, but it will not for that reason go away. Historians should know that freaks, if tolerated and even flattered and fed, can show astonishing influence and longevity. After all, to any rational mind, the greater part of the history of ideas is a history of freaks. This particular freak, I will argue, has not lodged itself firmly in a particular social couche, the bourgeois lumpen intelligentsia. Aspirant intellectuals whose amateurish intellectual preparation disarms them before manifest absurdities and elementary philosophical blunders, and whose innocence in intellectual practice leaves them paralyzed in the first web of scholastic argument which they encounter. And bourgeois, because while many of them would like to be revolutionaries, they are themselves the products of a particular conjuncture which has broken the circuits between intellectuality and practical experience, both in real political movements and in the actual segregation imposed by contemporary institutional structures. And hence, they are able to perform imaginary revolutionary psychodramas, in which each outbids the other in adopting ferocious verbal postures, while in fact falling back upon a very old tradition of bourgeois elitism, for which Althusserian theory is exactly tailored. Whereas their forebears were political interventionists, they tend more often to be diversionists, enclosed and imprisoned within their own drama, or internal emigres. Their practical importance remains, however considerable, in disorganizing the constructive intellectual course of discourse of the left and in reproducing continually the elitist division between theory and practice. Maybe if we suffer experiences sharp enough, the freak will eventually go away and many of its devotees may be reclaimed for a serious political and intellectual movement, but it is time that we pushed it along the road. The other reaction commonly found among historical materialists is more reprehensible, that of complicity. They glance at Althusserian Marxism and do not wholly understand it, nor like what they understand. But they accept it as a Marxism. Philosophers cannot be expected to understand history, or anthropology, or literature, or sociology. But Althusser is a philosopher doing his own thing as some conceptual rigor is no doubt necessary, perhaps even bits can be borrowed, over determination, instances. After all, we are all Marxists together. In this way, a sort of tacit compromise is negotiated, although most of the negotiation is made up of silence, and all the negotiation consists in ceding ground to Althusser. For Althusser has never offered compromise of any kind, and certainly not to historicism, humanism, and empiricism. This is reprehensible because it is theoretically unprincipled. Althusser and his acolytes challenge centrally historical materialism itself. They do not offer to modify it, but to displace it. In exchange, they offer an ahistorical theoreticism, which at the first examination discloses itself as idealism. How then is it possible for these two to coexist within one single tradition? Either a very extraordinary mutation has been, has been taking place in the last few years in the Marxist tradition, or that tradition is now breaking apart into two or several parts. What is being threatened, what is now actively rejected, is the entire 
tradition of substantive Marxist historical and political analysis, and its accumulating, if provisional, knowledge. And if, as I suppose, Althusserian Marxism is not only an idealism, but has many of the attributes of a theology, then what is at issue within the Marxist tradition is the defense of reason itself. 2. I will offer at the outset a map of where I mean to go, since there will inevitably be certain detours and the doubling back upon my own tracks. I shall direct my central attention to Althusser and to the critical form formative texts for Marx in Reading Capital, and will not spend time over his numerous progeny. It is true that many of these disown their master, and that others are influenced only in certain areas of their thought. But I hope that some of my general arguments, in particular on empiricism and moralism, may be taken to include them also. I apologize for this neglect, but life is too short to follow, for example, Hindus and Hearst, to every one of their theori theoreticist layers. Nor shall I take up the lists against a more formidable opponent, Polancis, who, with Althusser, repeatedly fails to understand the historical categories of class, ideology, etc., employed by Marx. Another time, perhaps, let us stay now with the Aristotle of the new Marxist idealism. I will argue the following propositions and examine them in sequence. One, Althusser's epistemology is derivative from a limited kind of academic learning process and has no general validity. Two, as a result, he has no category or way of handling experience or social beings impingement upon social consciousness. Hence, he falsifies the dialogue with empirical evidence inherent in knowledge production and in Marx's own practice and thereby falls continually into modes of thought designated in the Marxist tradition as idealist. Three, in particular, he confuses the necessary empirical dialogue with empiricism and consistently misrepre misrepresents in the most naive ways the practice of historical materialism, including Marx's own practice. Four, the resultant critique of historicism is at certain points identical to this specifically anti-Marxist critique of historicism, as represented by Popper, although the author is derived from this opposite conclusions. This argument will take us some way on our road. I will then propose five, Althusser's structuralism is a structuralism of stasis, departing from Marx's own historical method. Six, Hence, Althusser's conceptual universe has no adequate categories to explain contradiction or change or class struggle. Seven, these critical weaknesses explain why Althusser must be silent or evasive as to other important categories, among them economic and needs. Eight, from which it follows that Althusser and his progeny find themselves unable to handle, except in the most abstract and theoretical way, questions of value, culture, and political theory. When these elementary propositions have been established, or as Althusser will have it proved, we may then stand back from the whole elaborate and sophistical structure. We may even attempt another kind of reading of his words. And if we are not exhausted, we may propose some questions of a different kind. How has this extraordinary fracture occurred in the Marxist tradition? How are we to understand Althusserian structuralism, not in its self-evaluation as science, but as ideology? What were the specific conditions for the genesis and maturation of this ideology and its rapid replication in the West? And what is the political significance of this unmeasured assault upon historical materialism? Three. I commence my argument at a manifest disadvantage. Few spectacles would be more ludicrous than that of an English historian, and moreover, one manifestly self-incriminated of empirical practices, attempting to offer epistemological correction to a rigorous Parisian philosopher. I can sense, as I stare at the paper before me, the shadowy faces of an expectant audience, scarcely able to conceal their rising mirth. I don't intend to gratify them. I don't understand Althusser's propositions as to the relation between the real world and knowledge, and therefore I can't expose myself in a discussion of them. It's true that I've tried to understand them. 
threw out for Marx the question as to how these raw materials from the real world arrive in the laboratory of theoretical practice to be processed according to generalities one, two, and three, cries out for some answer. But the opportunity for disclosure is passed by. Turning to reading capital, we learn with rising excitement that now at last an answer will be given. Instead, we are offered anti-climax. We first endure some tedium and more exasperation as a ritual culmination against empiricism is conducted. Even a mind without philosophic rigor cannot overlook the fact that Althusser continually confuses and conflates the empirical mode or techniques of investigation with a quite different ideological formation, empiricism, and moreover simplifies his own polemics by caricaturing even this empiricism and ascribing to it indiscriminately and erroneously essentialist procedures of abstraction. But at length, after 50 pages, we arrive at what? We can say then that the mechanism of production of the knowledge effect lies in the mechanism which underlies the action of the forms of order in the scientific discourse of the, of the proof. That was a quotation from Althusser. 33 words and then silence. If I understand these words, then I find them disgraceful. For we have been led all this way only to be offered a re restatement in new terms of the original question. Knowledge effects arrive in the form of raw materials. Generalities one, which are already artifacts of culture with more or less ideological impurity. Obediently as the scientific discourse of the proof demands, I must explain my objection and first what my objection is not. I don't, I don't object to the fact that Althusser offers no guarantees as to an identity between the real object and its conceptual representation. One would expect any such formal guarantee to be of doubtful efficacy. Even a casual acquaintance with philosophy suggests that such guarantees have a short term of validity and contain many clauses in small print which exonerate the guarantor from liability. Nor do I object to the fact that Althusser has abandoned the weary ground of attempting to elucidate a one-to-one -one correspondence between this real material event or object and that perception, intuition, sense impression con concept. It would perhaps have been more honest if he had frankly confessed that in doing so, he was also abandoning certain of Lenin's propositions in materialism and imperial criticism. But for the least syllable of Lenin, he professes a religious awe. And he certainly might have confessed that in shifting his ground, he was following and not setting philosophical fashion. In the old days, one supposes, when the philosopher laboring by lamplight in his study came to this point in his argument, he set down his pen and looked around for an object in the real world to interrogate. Very commonly, that object was the nearest one to hand, his writing table. Table, he said, how do I know that you exist? And if you do, how do I know that my concept, table, represents your real existence? The table would look back without blinking and interrogate the philosopher in its turn. It was an exacting exchange and according to which one was the victor in the confrontation. The philosopher would inscribe himself as idealist or a materialist, or so one must suppose from the frequency with which tables appear. Today, the philosopher interrogates instead the word, a pre-given linguistic artifact with an indistinct social genesis and with a history. And here I begin to find terms for my objection. It is first that Althusser interrogates this word or this raw material or this knowledge effect too briefly. It exists only to be worked up by theoretical practice, generality two, to structural conceptualization or concrete knowledge, generality um, three. Althusser is as curt with linguistics and with the sociology of knowledge as he is with history or anthropology. His raw material, object of knowledge, is an inert, pliant kind of stuff with neither inertia nor energies of its own, awaiting passively its manufacture into knowledge. 
It may contain gross ideological impurities, to be sure, but these may be purged in the alembic of theoretical practice. Second, this raw material appears to present itself for processing as discrete mental events, facts, ideas, refuse, commonplace concepts, and it also presents itself with discretion. Now, I don't wish to jest with the very serious difficulties encountered by philosophers in this critical epistemological area. Since every philosopher encounters them, I must believe that these difficulties are indeed immense. And at this level, I can hope to add nothing to their clarification. But a historian in the Marxist tradition is entitled to remind a Marxist philosopher that historians also are concerned every day in their practice with the formation of and with the tensions within social consciousness. Our observation is rarely singular. This object of knowledge, this event, this elaborated concept. Our concern more commonly is with, with, is with multiple evidences whose interrelationship is indeed an object of our inquiry. Or if we isolate that singular evidence for particular scrutiny that evidence does not stand compliantly like a table for interrogation. It stirs in the medium of time before our eyes. These stirrings, these events, if they are within social being, seem often to impinge upon, thrust into, break against, existent social consciousness. They propose new problems, and above all, they continually give rise to experience, a category which, however imperfect it may be, is indispensable to the historian, since it comprises the mental and emotional response, whether of an individual or of a social group, to many interrelated events, or to many repetitions of the same kind of event. It may perhaps be argued that experience is a very low level of mentation indeed, that it can produce no more than the grossest common sense, ideologically contaminated raw material, scarcely qualifying to enter the laboratory of generalities one. I don't think that this is so. On the contrary, I consider that the supposition that this is so is a very characteristic delusion of intellectuals who suppose that ordinary mortals are stupid. In my own view, the truth is more nuanced. Experience is valid and effective, but within determined limits. The farmer knows his seasons, the sailor knows his skis, but both may remain mystified about kinship and cosmology. But the point immediately before us is not the limits of experience, but the manner of its arrival or production. Experience arises spontaneously within social being, but it does not arise without thought. It arises because men and women, and not only philosophers, are rational, and they think about what is happening to themselves and their world. If we are to employ the difficult notion that social being determines social consciousness, how are we to suppose that this is so? It will surely not be supposed that being is here as gross materiality from all ideality has been abstracted, or from which all ideality has been abstracted, and that consciousness as abstract ideality is there. For we cannot conceive of any form of social being independently of its organizing concepts and expectations, nor could social being reproduce itself for a day without thought. What we mean is that changes take place within social being, which give rise to changed experience. And this experience is determining in the sense that it exerts pressures upon existent social consciousness, proposes new questions and affords much of the material which the more elaborated intellectual exercises are about. Experience, one supposes, constitutes some part of the raw material which is offered up to the procedures of the scientific discourse of the proof. Indeed, some intellectual practitioners have suffered experiences themselves. Experience, then, does not arrive obediently in the way that Althusser proposes. One suspects that some very e Etiolated, etiolated notion of knowledge is here. He has offered to us less an epistemology which takes into account the actual formative motions of consciousness than a description of certain procedures of academic life. He has abandoned the lamp-lit study and broken off the dialogue with an exhausted table. 
he is now within the emplacements of the École Normale Supérieure. The data have arrived, obediently processed by graduates and research assistants, at a rather low level of conceptual development. Generality 1. They have been interrogated and sorted into categories by a rig rigorous seminar of aspirant professors. Generalities 2. And the generalities 3 is about to ascend the rostrum and propound the conclusions of concrete knowledge. But outside the university precincts, another kind of knowledge production is going on all the time. I will agree that it is not always rigorous. I am not careless of intellectual values, nor unaware of the difficulty of their attainment. But I must remind a Marxist philosopher that knowledges have been and still are formed outside the academic procedures. Nor have these been in the test of practice negligible. They have assisted men and women to till the fields, to construct houses, to support elaborate social organizations, and even, on occasion, to challenge effectively the conclusions of academic thought. Nor is this all. Althusser's account also leaves out the thrusting forth of the real world, spontaneously and not at all decor decorously proposing hitherto unarticulated questions to philosophers. Experience does not wait discreetly outside their offices, waiting for the moment at which the discourse of the proof, proof will summon it into, ex into attendance. Experience walks in without knocking at the door and announces deaths, crises of subsistence, trench warfare, unemployment, inflation, genocide. People start. Their survivors think in new ways about the market. People are imprisoned in prison. They meditate in new ways about the law. In the face of such general experiences, old conceptual systems may crumble and, and new problematics insist upon their presence. Such imperative presentation of knowledge effects is not allowed for in Althusser's epistemology which is that of a recipient, a manufacturer who is not concerned with the genesis of his raw material so long as it arrives to time. What Althusser overlooks is the dialogue between social being and social consciousness. Obviously, this dialogue goes in both directions. If social being is not an inert table which cannot refute a philosopher with its legs, then neither is social consciousness a passive recipient of reflections of that table. Obviously, consciousness, whether as unselfconscious unself culture, or as myth, or as science, or law, or articulated ideology, thrusts back into being in its turn, as being is thought so, as being is thought, so thought also is lived. People may, within limits, live the social or sexual expectations which are imposed upon them by dominant conceptual categories. It had been habitual among Marxists. Indeed, it had once been thought to be a distinguishing methodological priority of Marxism, to stress the determining pressures of being upon consciousness. Although in recent years, much Western Marxism has tilted the dialogue heavily back towards ideological domination. This difficult question, which many of us have often addressed, may be left aside for the moment. It is, in any case, a question more usefully resolved by historical and cultural analysis than by theoretical pronouncements. If I have stressed the first party, if I have stressed the first party in the dialogue rather than the second, it is because Althusser has almost nothing to say about it and refuses to attend the accounts of historians or anthropologists who have. His, si his silence here is both a guilty one and one necessary to his purpose. It is a consequence of his prior determination to wall up the least aperture through which empiricism, empiricism might enter. 4. Let us resume. Althusser's epistemology is founded upon an account of theoretical procedures, which is at every point derivative not only from academic intellectual disciplines, but from one, and at the most, three highly specialized disciplines. The discipline is, of course, his own philosophy. 
but of a particular Cartesian tradition of logical exe exegesis. <laughs> marked at its origin by the pressures of Catholic theology, modified by the monism of Spinoza, whose influence saturates Althusser's work, and marked at its conclusion by a particular Parisian dialogue between phenomenology, existentialism, and Marxism. Thus, the procedures from which an epistemology is derived are not those of philosophy in general, but of one particular moment of its presence. There's no reason why philosophers should necessarily identify their own procedures with those of every other kind of knowledge production. And many have been at pains to make distinctions. It is an elementary confusion, a function of academic imperialism, and it is also, and it is a tendency rather easy to correct, and it has been very often so corrected. But not by Althusser. On the contrary, he makes a virtue of his own theoretical imperialism. The peculiarity of certain branches of philosophy and of mathematics is that these are, to an unusual degree, self-enclosed and self-replicating. Logic and quantity examine their own materials, their own procedures. This Althusser offers as a paradigm of the very procedures of theory. Generality 2, theoretical practice, works upon generality 1, to produce generality three. The potential truth of the materials in generality one, despite all ideological impurities, is guaranteed by a hidden Spinozan monism. Um, idea vera debet cum suo ideato convenir. A true idea must agree with its original in nature, or in Althusserian terms, generality one would not present itself if it did not correspond to the real. It is the business of the scientific procedures of generality two to purify generality one of ideological admixture and to produce knowledge, generality three, which in its own theoretical consistency contains its own guarantees. Veritas norma sui et falsi. Truth is the criterion both of itself and of falsehood. In a brief aside, Althusser allows that generality too may, in certain disciplines, follow somewhat different procedures. The discourse of the proof may even be conducted in the form of experiment. This is his only concession. Generality too, he admits, deserves a much more serious examination than I can embark on, embark upon here. And so it does. For such an examination, if scrupulously conducted, would have exposed to view Althusser's continuous, willful, and theoretically crucial confusion between empiricism, that is, philosophical positivism and all its kin, and the empirical mode of intellectual practice. This question lies close to the question of historicism, a matter in which I have my own declared interest, and so I cannot dispatch it so quickly. <clears throat> Generalities 1 include those mental events which are generally called facts or evidence. Co contrary to the ideological illusions of empiricism or centralism, Althusser tells us these facts are not singular or concrete. They are already concepts of an ideological nature. The work of any science consists in elaborating its own scientific facts through a critique of the ideological facts elaborated by an earlier ideological theoretical practice. To elaborate its own specific facts is simultaneously to elaborate its own theory, since a scientific fact, and not the self-styled pure phenomenon, can only be identified in the field of a theoretical practice. This work of elaborating its own facts out of the raw material of pre-existent ideological concepts is done by generality too, which is the working body of concepts and procedures of the discipline in question. That there are difficulties in the mode of operation of generality too is acknowledged, but these difficulties are left unexamined. We must rest content with these schematic gestures and not enter into the dialectic of this theoretical labor. This is wise since the difficulties are substantial. One of them is this, how does knowledge ever change or advance? If the raw material or the evidence, generality one, which is presented to a science, generality two, is already fixed within a given ideological field, and if generality one is the only route, however shadowy, 
by which the world of material and social reality can affect an entry, a shame-faced ideological entry, into, lab into the laboratories of theory, then it is not possible to understand by what means generality too can affect any relevant or realistic critique of the ideological impurities presented to it. In short, Althusser's schema either show us how ideological illusions can reproduce themselves endlessly or may evolve in aberrant or fortuitous ways, or it proposes with Spinoza that theoretical procedures in themselves can refine ideological impurities out of their given materials by no other means than the scientific discourse of the proof. Or, finally, it proposes some ever pre-given imminent Marxist idea outside the material and social world, of which idea this world is in effect. Althusser argues by turns the second and the third proposition, although his work is in fact a demonstration of the first. But we may leave this difficulty aside since it would be unkind to interrogate it too strictly a generality which has only been offered to us with schematic gestures. It is possible that Althusser is describing procedures appropriate to certain kinds of exercise in logic. We examine, let us say, a passage of text from Rousseau, generality one. The uses of the words and the consistency of the logic is scrutinized according to rigorous philosophical or critical procedures, generality two. And we arrive at a knowledge, generality three, which may be a useful knowledge and within the term of its own discipline, true, but which is critical rather than substantive. To confuse these procedures, appropriate within their own limits, with all procedures of knowledge production is the kind of elementary error which, one would suppose, could be committed only by students early in their careers, habituated to attending seminars and to, in textual criticism of this kind, and apprentices rather than practitioners of their discipline. They have not yet arrived at those other and equally difficult procedures of research, experiment, and of the intellectual appropriation of the real world, without which the secondary but important critical procedures would have neither meaning nor existence. In by far the greatest area of knowledge production, oh sorry, in by far the greatest area of knowledge production, a very different kind of dialogue is going on. It is untrue that the evidence or facts under investigation always arrive, as generality one, already in an ideological form. In the experimental sciences, there are extremely elaborate procedures appropriate to each discipline intended to, assure, to ensure that they do not. This is not, of course, to argue that scientific facts disclose their own meanings independently of conceptual organization. It is central to every other applied discipline in the social sciences and humanities that similar procedures are elaborated, although, although these are necessarily less exact and more subject to ideological determinations. The difference between a mature intellectual discipline and a merely ideological formation, theology, astrology, some parts of bourgeois sociology and of orthodox Stalinist Marxism and perhaps Althusserian structuralism lies exactly in these procedures and controls. For if the object of knowledge consisted only in ideological facts elaborated by that discipline's own procedures, then there would never be any way of validate, validating or falsifying any proposition. There could be no scientific or disciplinary court of appeal. The absurdity of Althusser consists in the idealist mode of his theoretical constructions. His thought is the child of economic determinism ravished by theoreticist idealism. It posits, but does not attempt to prove or guarantee the existence of material reality. We will accept this point. It posits also the existence of a material external world of social reality, whose determinate organization is always in the last instance economic. The proof for this lies not in Althusser's work, nor would it be reasonable to ask for such proof in the work of a philosopher, but in the mature work of Marx. This work arrives ready-made at the commencement of Althusser's inquiry as a concrete knowledge, albeit a knowledge not always aware of its own theoretical practice. It is Althusser's business to enhance its own self-knowledge, as well as to repel various hideous ideological impurities 
which have grown up within the silences of its interstices. Thus a given knowledge, Marx's work informs Althusser's procedures at each of the three levels of his hierarchy. Marx's work arrives as raw material, however elaborate, a generality one. It is interrogated and processed, generality two, according to principles of science derived from its mature apophis, unstated assumptions, implicit methodologies, etc. And the outcome is to confirm and reinforce the concrete knowledge, generality three, which approved portions of Marx's work already announce. It scarcely seems necessary to insist that this procedure is wholly self-confirming. It moves within the circle not only of its own problematic, but of its own self-perpetuating and self-elaborating procedures. This is, in the eyes of Althusser and his followers, exactly the virtue of this theoretical practice. It is a sealed system within which concepts endlessly circulate, recognize, and interrogate each other, and the intensity of its repetitious introversion introversial life is mistaken for a science. This science is then projected back upon Marx's work. It is proposed that his own procedures were of the same order, and that after the miracle of the epistemological break, an immaculate conception which required no gross empirical impregnation, all followed in terms of the elaboration of thought and its structural organization. Here's a quote from Althusser. May I sum up all this in one sentence? This sentence describes a circle. A philosophic reading of capital is only possible as the application of that which is the very object of our investigation, Marxist philosophy. This circle is only epistemologically possible because of the existence of Marxist philosophy in the works of Marxism. To facilitate the discourse of the proof, we return to some passages of Marx, but now as raw material, generality one, <clears throat> The hand is held over all Marx's immature work, nearly all of the work of Engels, these portions of Marx's mature work, which exemplify the practice of historical materialism, the correspondence of Marx and Engels, which take, which take us directly into their laboratory and show us their procedures, and the greater part of capital itself, illustrations. But between the fingers of the hand, one is allowed to peep at decontexted phrases of Marx at silences and at subarticulate mediations, which are chastised and disciplined until they confirm the self-sufficiency of theoretical practice. Of course, if the questions are proposed in this way, and if the material is called out, already drilled in its responses and permitted to answer these questions and no others, then we can expect it to offer to the interrogator a dutiful allegiance. This mode of thought is exactly what has commonly been designated in the Marxist tradition as idealism. Such idealism consists not in the positing or denial of the primacy of an, in, an uh, ulterior material world, but in a self-generating conceptual universe which imposes its own ideality upon the phenomena of material and social existence, rather than engaging in continual dialogue with these. If there is a Marxism of the contemporary contemporary world, which Marx or Engels would have recognized instantly as an idealism, Althusserian structuralism is this. The category has attained to a primacy over its material referent. The conceptual structure hangs above and dominates social being. Five, I don't propose to, to counter Althusser's paradigm of knowledge production with an alternative universal paradigm of my own, but I will follow him a little further into my own discipline. It is not easy to do this with an even temper, since his repeated references to history and to historicism display his theoretical imperialism in its most arrogant forms. His comments display throughout no acquaintance with, nor understanding of historical procedures that is, procedures which make of history a discipline and not a babble of alternating ideological assertions, procedures which provide for their own relevant discourse of the proof. However, let us be cool. Let us approach this problem, not from the suburbs, what historians think that they are doing when they consult and argue about evidence, but at the citadel itself, Althusser's notion of theory. 
if we can storm that aloof, castellated, and preposterous imperial citadel, then we will save our energies from skirmishes in the surrounding terrain. The land will fall into our hand. History, Althusser tells us, hardly exists other than as the application of a theory which, which does not exist in any real sense. The applications of the theory of history somehow occur behind this absent theory's back and are naturally mistaken for it. This absent theory depends upon more or less ideological outlines of theories. Um, this is a quotation from Althusser. We must take seriously the fact that the theory of history in the strong sense does not exist or hardly exists so far as historians are concerned, that the concepts of existing history are therefore nearly always empirical concepts, more or less in search of their theoretical basis. Empirical, i.e. crossbred with a powerful strain of an ideology concealed behind its obviousness. This is the case with the best historians who can be distinguished from the rest precisely by their concern for theory, but who seek this theory at a level on which it cannot be found at the level of historical me methodology, which cannot be refined, re yeah, which cannot be refined without the theory on which it is based. That's the end of the quote. We will pause for a moment to note one oddity. There has existed for 50 years or more, very much more if we remember Engels and Marx, a Marxist historiography, which, as I have already remarked, now has an international presence. It is curious, then, that all these historians, who might, one supposes, include one or two whom Althusser would nominate as among the best, have been operating through all these decades without any theory. For they had supposed that their theory was exactly derivative in some part from Marx, or from, Al from what Althusser would designate as theory. That is, the critical concepts employed by these historians every day in their practice included those of exploitation, class struggle, class determinism, ideology, and feudalism and capitalism as modes of production, etc., etc., concepts derived from and validated within a Marxist theoretical tradition. So this is odd. Historians have no theory. Marxist historians have no theory either. Historical theory, then, must be something different from Marxist historical theory. But let us resume our survey of the citadel. We must climb crag after crag before we attain the summit. Theory cannot be found at the level of historical practice, whether Marxist or not. Excelsior. The truth of history cannot be read in its manifest discourse because the text of history is not a text in which a voice, the Logos, speaks, but the inaudible and, and illegible notation of the effects of a structure of structures. That sentence was a quote from Althusser. Not many historians suppose that the manifest discourse of history voluntarily discloses some truth, nor that the Logos is whispering in their ears. But even so, Althusser's pat antithesis is somehow awry. Inaudible and illegible? Not wholly so. Notation of the effects? Perhaps, as a metaphor, we, met, we might let this pass. But is it not a metaphor which leads precisely to the notion of the abstraction of an essence from the real which contains it and keeps it in hiding, which Althusser, in a different mood, castigates as the hallmark of empiricism? Of the effects of a structure of structures, where, then, is this structure of structures situated? if it is subject to no empirical investigation, and also, we recall, lies outside the level of historical methodology. If we may ask a vulgar question, is this structure of structures there, immersed in history's happenings, or is it somewhere outside? For example, a logos which speaks, not from the text of history, but out of some philosophical head. The question is relevant, says Althusser, Worse, it is improper. It is guilty. It arises from a bourgeois and empiricist problematic. To say that structure could be disclosed by procedures of historical investigation is meaningless, because all that we can ever know of history are certain conceptual representations. Impure generalities one. Hence, historical truth can be disclosed only within theory itself, by theoretical procedures. The process that produces 
the concrete knowledge takes place wholly in the theoretical practice. The formal rigor of these procedures is the only proof of the truth of this knowledge and of its correspondence to real phenomena. Concrete knowledge thus established carries with it all guarantees that are necessary or that can be that can ever be obtained. History itself is not temporality, but an epistemological category designating the object of a certain science, historical materialism. The knowledge of history is no more historical than the knowledge of sugar is sweet. This ultimate ascent to the citadel is defended by an idealist netting of assertions so densely textured as to be almost impenetrable. We may construct our knowledge of history only within knowledge, in the process of knowledge, not in the development of the real concrete. And of course, since everything that we think takes place within thought and its symbols, codes and representations, this is a truism. What occasions surprise is that it was possible for a philosopher in the late 1960s to reiterate such truisms with such rhetorical fury, with such severe castigation of always unidentified opponents and with such an assumption of novelty. But the rhetoric and the postures of severity are not innocent. They are devices to carry the reader from such truisms to the very different proposition that knowledge emerges wholly within thought by means of its own theoretical self-extrapolation. Thus, in one elision, it is possible to dismiss both the question of experience, how generality one are presented to theory, and the question of specific procedures of investigation, um, experimental or other, which constitute that empirical dialogue, which I will shortly consider. Um, thus, Althusser says, Once they are truly constituted and developed, the sciences have no need for verification from external practices to declare the knowledges they produce to be true, i.e. to be knowledges. No mathematician in the world waits until physics has verified a theorem to declare it proved. The truth of his theorem is 100% provided by criteria purely internal to the practice of mathematical proof, hence by the criterion of mathematical practice i.e. by the forms required by existing mathematical scientificity. We can say the same for the results of every science. That's the end of the quote. Can we indeed? Once again, Althusser falls back upon a discipline which, insofar as it, as it contemplates the logic of its own materials, is a special case. The notion that mathematics could serve as a paradigm not only for logic, but for the production of knowledge has haunted the Cartesian tradition, not least in the heretic thought of Spinoza. And Althusser goes on to declare triumphantly, we should say the same of the science which concerns us most particularly, historical materialism. It has been possible to apply Marx's theory with success because it is true. It is not true because it has been applied with success. The statement provides its own premise. Because Marx's theory is true, undemonstrated, it has been applied with success. True theories usually can be so applied, but how are we to determine this success? Within the historical discipline? And what about those occasions when Marx's theories have been applied without success? If we were to propose this statement in this form, it has been possible to apply Marx's theory with success insofar as the theory has been true. Where the theory has been successful, it has confirmed the theory's truth. Then we would find ourselves within a different epistemological discourse. To resume, Althusser allows in a perfunctory clause, this is evidently a matter at a very low level of theory indeed, that no doubt there is a relation between thought about the real and this real, but it is a relation of knowledge, a relation of adequacy or inadequacy of knowledge not a real relation, meaning by this a relation inscribed in that real of which the thought is the adequate or inadequate knowledge. This knowledge relation between knowledge of the real and the real is not a relation of the real that is known in the relationship. 
The distinction between a relation of knowledge and a relation of the real is a fundamental one. If we did not respect it, we should fall irreversibly into either speculative idealism if, with Hegel, we confuse thought and the real by reducing the real to thought, by conceiving the real as the result of thought, into empiricist idealism if we confuse thought with the real by reducing thought about the real to the real itself. That whole thing about the real and the real and real was a quote from Althusser. I do not pretend to understand this very well. It would not occur to me to define the relation between knowledge and its real object in terms of a relationship to which there were two active parties. The real, as it were, attempting actively to disclose itself to the recipient mind. The real, however active in its other manifestations, is epistemologically null or inert. That is, it can become an object of epistemological inquiry only at the point where it enters within the field of perception or knowledge. In Codwell's words, object and subject as exhibited by the mind relation come into being simultaneously. And knowing is a mutually determining relation between knowing and being. There could be no means of deciding the adequacy or inadequacy of knowledge, as against the special cases of logic, mathematics, etc., unless one supposes procedures, a dialogue of practice, devised to establish the correspondence of this knowledge to properties inscribed in that real. Once again, Althusser has jumped from a truism to theoreticist solipsism. He has approached the problem with a commonplace assertion which presents no difficulties. Thought about the real, the conception of the real, and all the operations of thought by which the real is thought or conceived belong to the order of thought. The elements of thought which must not be confused with the order of the real. Where else could thought take place? But the knowledge relation um, but the knowledge relation between knowledge of the real and the real can still perfectly well be a real and de and determining relation that is, a relation of the active appropriation by one party, thought, of the other party, collective attributes of the real. And this relation may take place not on any terms which thought prescribes, but in ways which are determined by the properties of the real object. The properties of reality determine both the appropriate procedures of thought, that is, their adequacy or inadequacy, and its product, Herein consists the dialogue between consciousness and being. I will give an illustration, and aha, I see my table to be an object. To be null or inert does not remove that object from being a determining party within a subject-object relation. No piece of timber has ever been known to make itself into a table. No joiner has ever been known to make a table out of air or sawdust. The joiner appropriates this timber, and in working it up into a table, he is governed both by his skill, theoretical practice itself arising from a history or experience of making tables, as well as a history of the evolution of appropriate tools, and by the qualities, size, grain, seasoning, etc., of the timber itself. The wood imposes its properties and its logic upon the joiner as the joiner imposes his tools skills in his ideal conception of tables upon the wood. This illustration may tell us little about the relation between thought and its object, since thought is not a joiner, nor is it engaged in this kind of manufacturing process. But it may serve to emphasize one possible form of relation between an active subject and an inert object, wherein the object remains within limits, determinant, the wood cannot determine what is made, nor whether it is made well or badly, but it can certainly determine what cannot be made, the limits, size, strength, etc., of what is made, and the skills and tools appropriate to the making. In such an equation, thought, if it is true, can only represent what is appropriate to the determined properties of its real object and must operate within the determined field. If it breaks free, then it becomes engaged in freakish, freakish speculative botching and the self-extrapolation of a knowledge of tables out of pre-existent bigotry. 
Since this knowledge does not correspond to the reality of the wood, it will very soon demonstrate its own adequacy or inadequacy as soon as we sit down at it. It is likely to collapse, spilling its whole load of elaborate epistemological sauces to the floor. The real object, I have said, is epistemologically inert. That is, it cannot impose or disclose itself to knowledge, all that takes place within thought and its procedures. But this does not mean that it is inert in other ways. It need by no means be sociologically or ideologically inert. And to cap all, the real is not out there and thought within the quiet lecture theater of our heads. Inside here, thought in being inhabit a single space, which space is ourselves. Even as we think we also hunger and hate, we sicken or we love and consciousness is intermixed with being. Even as we contemplate the real, we experience our own palpable reality. So that the problems which the raw materials present to thought often consist exactly in their very active, indicative, intrusive qualities. For the dialogue between consciousness and being becomes increasingly complex. Indeed, it attains at once to a different order of complexity, which presents a different order of epistemological problems. When the critical consciousness is acting upon a raw material made up of its own kind of stuff, intellectual artifacts, social relationships, the historical event. A historian certainly, or a historian, certainly a Marxist historian, should be well aware of this, that dead inert text of his evidence is by no means inaudible. It has a deafening vitality of its own. Voices clamor from the past, asserting their own meanings, appearing to disclose their own self-knowledge as knowledge. If we offer a commonplace fact, King Zed died in 1100 AD, we are already offered a concept of kinship, kingship, the relations of domination and subordination, the functions and role of the office, the charisma and magical endowments attaching to that role, etc. And we are presented with these not only as an object of investigation, a concept which performed certain functions in mediating relationships in a given society, with perhaps several conflicting notations of this concept endorsed by different social groups, the priests, the serving girls, within that society. Not only this, which the historian has to recover with difficulty, but also this evidence is received by the historian within a theoretical framework. The discipline of history, which itself has a history and a disputed present, which has refined the concept of kingship, from the study of many examples of kingship in very different societies, resulting in concepts of kingship very different from the immediacy, in power, in common sense, or in myth of those who actually witnessed King Zed die. These difficulties are immense, but the difficulties are multiplied many times over when we are considering not one event or concept, kingship, but those events which most historians regard as central to their study historical process, the interrelationship between disparate phenomena as economies and ideologies, causation, the relationship between thought and its object now becomes so exceedingly complex and mediated, and moreover, the resulting historical knowledge establishes relations between phenomena which can never be seen, felt, or experienced by the actors in these ways at the time and it organizes the findings according to concepts and within categories which were unknown to the women and men whose actions make up the object of study. All these difficulties are so immense that it becomes apparent that real history and historical knowledge are things totally distinct. And so of course they are. What else could they be? But does it thereby follow that we must cut down the bridge between them? May not the object, real history, still stand in an objective, empirically verifiable relationship to its knowledge, and a relationship which is, within limits, determinant. In the face of the complexities of such a conclusion, a certain kind of rational mind, in particular, and in particular, a rational mind innocent of practical knowledge of historical procedures, and impatient for an easy route to the absolute, recoils. This recoil can take many forms. It is of interest, and it ought to be of interest to Marxists, 
that at the initial stage of the recoil, both empiricism and Althusserian structuralism arrive at an, at an identical repudiation of, his, of historicism. So far from Althusser's positions being original, they signify a capitulation to decades of conventional academic criticism of, his, of historiography, whose outcome has sometimes been relativist. History as an expression of the preoccupations of the present, sometimes idealist and theoreticist, and sometimes one of extreme radical skepticism, skepticism as to history's epistemological credentials. One route may have been through Husserl and Heidegger, another through Hegel and Lucas, another through a more empirical tradition of Anglo-Saxon linguistic philosophy, but all routes have led to a common terminus. At the end of his working life, it was possible for that formidable practitioner of historical materialism, Mark Bloch, to assume with robust confidence the objective and determinate character of his materials. The past is, by definition, a datum, which nothing in the future will change. By the 1960s, no such confidence might be expressed in respectable intellectual company. It was possible for a gifted writer within the Marxist tradition to assume historical relativism as a commonplace. For the human sciences, the historical individuality is constructed by the choice of what is essential for us, i.e. in terms of our value judgments. Thus, historical reality changes from epoch to epoch with modifications in the hierarchy of values. The particular reasons proposed for history's epistemological lack of credibility have been different, as have been the preferred solutions. But Oakeshott and Althusser, Lucien Goldman and Raymond Aaron, Popper and Hindus, Hurst, have all been loitering in the same area with similar intent. History had perhaps called down this revenge upon itself. I don't mean to deny that the 19th and 20th centuries engendered authentic and sometimes monstrous historicisms, evolutionary, teleological, and essentialist notions of history's self-motivation, nor to deny that the same historicism permeated some part of the Marxist tradition in the notion of a programmed succession of historical stages motored towards a predetermined end by class struggle. All this merited severe correction, but the correction administered to historical materialism too often assumed its guilt without scrupulous inquiry into its practice, or if examples of guilt were identified, often in the work of ideologues rather than in the, in the mature practice of historians, it was then assumed that these invalidated the whole exercise rather than calling in question the practitioner or the maturity of historical knowledge. And if critics and philosophers calling wood apart were rather generally guilty of this convenient elision, no one has been more outrageous in his attribution of historicism to the practice of historical materialism than Althusser. From start to finish, the practice of historians and of Marxist historians is assumed by him not, uh, is assumed by him but not examined. Let us return the scrutiny of criticism back upon the critics and see how Althusser and Popper came to a common rejection of historicism. For Popper, there is a very limited sense in which he will allow that certain facts of history are empirically verifiable. But once we step across a shadowy but critical border from discrete facts or particular evidences to questions of process, social formations and relationships, or causation, we instantly enter a realm in which we must either be guilty of historicism, which consists for him in part in attributing to history predictive laws, or in propounding general interpretations, which arise from improper holistic categories imposed by the interpreting mind, which are empirically unverifiable and which we smuggle into history ourselves, or we are avowedly offering an interpretation as a point of view. The discrete facts are in any case contaminated by their random or pre-selected provenance. Evidence about the past either survives in arbitrary ways or in ways which impose a particular presupposition on the historical investigator. And since the so-called sources of history only record such facts as appeared sufficiently interesting to record, the sources will, as a rule, 
contain only facts that fit in with preconceived theory. And since no further facts are available, it will not, as a rule, be possible to test that or any other subsequent theory. Most interpretations will be circular in the sense that they must fit in with that interpretation, which was used in the original selection of the facts. Hence, historical knowledge in any larger general sense is its own artifact. While Popper allows that an interpretation may be disproved, because it does not correspond with empirically ascertainable discrete facts, an allowance which Althusser cannot make, by his criteria of proof, criteria derived from the natural sciences, we can go no further. The experimental proof of any interpretation is possible. Hence, interpretation belongs to a category outside of historical knowledge, point of view, although each generation has a right and even a pressing need to offer its own interpretation or point of view as a contribution to its own self-understanding and self-evaluation. Thus, proper, we cannot know history, or at best, we may know only discrete facts, and these ones which happen to have survived through their own or historical self-selection. Interpretation consists in the introduction of a point of view. This may be legitimate on other grounds, but it does not constitute any true historical knowledge. Althusser sets out from much the same premise, although the suggestion that we can know even discrete facts encounters his scorn, since no fact can attain to epistemological identity or the significance of any meaning until it is placed within a theoretical or ideological field. And the theoretical act is prior to and informs whatever is pretended as empirical investigation. In Althusser's schema, ideology or theory take on the functions offered by Popper as interpretation or point of view. It is only in their conclusions that we find any marked disagreement. For Popper, there is no history of mankind. There is only an indefinite number of histories of all kinds of aspects of human life. These histories are created by historians out of an infinite subject matter, according to contemporary preoccupations. The emphasis falls with the monotony of a steam hammer upon the unknowability of any objective historical process and upon the dangers of historicist attribution. We must grope out way backwards in an empiricist dusk, making out the dim facts at our feet, piecemeal and one at a time. But where Popper sees danger, Althusser sees a splendid opportunity, a conceptual space, a vacancy inviting his imperial occupation. Historical process is unknowable as a real object. Historical knowledge is the product of theory. Theory invents history, either as ideology or as theory, science. The only trouble is, we remember, that the theory of history is the strong sense, in the strong sense, does not exist. But Althusser can provide this theory to historians. We have no need to grope in the dusk. We will leap with one gigantic epistemological bound from darkness to day. We have already noted this astounding idealism. To be sure, idealism is something that Althusser is very stern, even prim about. Speculative idealism, he tells us, confuses thought and the real by reducing the real to thought and by conceiving the real as the result of thought. Now Althusser does not, in so many words, make this superfluous gesture. To deny explicitly the prior existence of a material world might even call down upon him some curious looks from the leaders of the PCF. As a dutiful materialist, Althusser asserts that the real does exist somewhere out there. <clears throat> Althusser says, For us, the real is not a theoretical slogan. The real is the real object that exists independently of its knowledge which can only be defined by its knowledge. In this second theoretical relation, the real is identical to the means of knowing it. And just so, over 350 years ago, a philosopher arguing from an opposite brief declared, for us, God is not a theoretical slogan. God is the first cause who exists independently of our knowledge, etc. Or to be more precise, certain is that God worketh nothing in nature, but by second causes. The argument did not prevent Francis Bacon from being accused as a secret atheist, and Althusser should not be surprised at being accused of dissolving reality in an idealist fiction. For this pious and necessary gesture, once made as a kind of genetic a priori, 
and in the last instance proviso, the reel is shuffled quickly off the scene. All that thought can know is thought, and pretty bad artifacts of thought at that, for the mind of man is like an enchanted glass full of superstition and imposture, if it be not delivered and reduced. Theory must now set that right. Althusser does not so much confuse thought in the real, as by asserting the unknowability of the real, he confiscates reality of its determinate properties, thus reducing the real to theory. This theory lay imminent, awaiting Marx's epistemological break, and the knowledge then appropriated by Marx, although revealed would be a better word, was determined in no way by its object. Historians have entirely misread capital. According to Althusser, they did not see that history features in capital as an object of theory, not as a real object, as an abstract conceptual object, and not as a real concrete object, and that the chapters in which Marx applies the first stages of a historical treatment either to the struggles to shorten the working day or to primitive capitalist accumulation refer to the theory of history as their principal, to the construction of the concept of history and of its developed forms of which the economic theory of the capitalist mode of production constitutes one determinate region. And again, he says, despite appearances, Marx does not analyze any concrete society, not even England, which he, which he mentions constantly in volume one, but the capitalist mode of production and nothing else. We must not imagine that Marx is analyzing the concrete situation in England when he discusses it. He only discusses it in order to illustrate his abstract theory of the capitalist mode of production. Arrayed in the scarlet and furred gown of theory, Althusser may now storm into every adjacent lecture theater, and in the name of philosophy denounce the incumbents and expropriate them of their poor defective disciplines, which pretend to be knowledges. Before these disciplines may, be, may proceed at all, they must first sit before his rostrum and master his lessons. In particular, the specialists who work in the domains of the human sciences and of the social sciences. A smaller domain, i.e. economists, historians, sociologists, social, social psychologists, psychologists, historians of art and literature or religion, religious and other ideologies, and even linguists and psychoanalysts, all these specialists ought to know that they cannot produce truly scientific knowledges in their specializations unless they recognize the indispensability of the theory Marx founded. For it is in principle the theory which opens up to scientific knowledge the continent in which they work, in which they have so far only produced a few preliminary knowledges, linguistics, psychoanalysis, or a few elements of rudiments of knowledge, the occasional chapter of history, sociology, or economics, or illusions pure and simple, illegitimately called knowledges. No matter if the vassals in these continents or smaller domains had supposed themselves to be Marxists already, they were impostors and should perhaps not pay a double tribute to the theory which Marx founded, but which no one, including notably Marx, understood before the enunciation of Althusser. As for my own poor, laborious discipline of history, the expropriation of our petty principality, no doubt a very small domain indeed is total. We must once again purify our concept of the theory of history and purify it radically of any contamination by the obviousness of empirical history, since we know that this empirical history is merely the bare face of the empiricist ideology of history. We must grasp in all its rigor the absolute necessity of liberating the theory of history from any compromise with empirical temporality. Above all, we must overthrow the incredible power of, of a prejudice which is the basis for contemporary historicism and which would have us confuse the object of knowledge with the real object by attributing to the object of knowledge the same qualities as the real object of which it is the knowledge. It is clear that Althusser and his regiment of assistants intend to impose punitive taxation on this petty and now subjugated domain of history and to visit our sins upon the heads of our children down to the third generation. One stands astounded in this inverted world of absurdity, and yet its magic transfixes those minds which stray within, unless they come in 
they come in under arms and under the discipline of criticism. Common sense will do them no good. Every visitor is searched at the frontier and stripped of that. Enchanted minds move through humorless, visionary fields, negotiate imaginary obstacles, slay mythical monsters, humanism and moralism, perform tribal rites with the rehearsal of approved texts. There is drama. The initiates feel that they have something to do. They are developing a science as they discover fresh silences and marks and extrapolate further from the self-extrapolating reasons of theory. And there is the greater drama of heretics and heresies as pupils and disciples fall from the faith, as rival prophets arise, and as sub- and post-Althusarianisms and derivative structuralisms, linguistic and semiotic, multiply. Of course, for it is exactly in conditions when a theory or a theology is subject to no empirical controls, the disputes about the placing of one term lead on to theoretical parturition, the parturition of intellectual parthenogenesis. So that is where we are. One more astonishing aberrant spectacle is added to the phantasmagoria of our time. It is a bad time for the rational mind to live, for a rational mind in Marxist tradition. It's a time that cannot be endured. The real world also gesticulates at reason with its own inversions. Obscene contradictions manifest themselves, jest and then vanish. The known and the unknown change places, even as we examine them. Categories dissolve and change into their opposites. In the West, a bourgeois soul yearns for a Marxism to heal its own alienation. In the communist world, a proclaimed socialist basis gives rise to a superstructure of orthodox Christian faith, corrupt materialism, Slav nationalism, and Sol Solzhenitsyn. In that world, Marxism performs the function of an ideological state apparatus, and Marxists are alienated, not in their self-identity, but in the, contempt of the, in the contempt of the people. An old and arduous rational tradition breaks down into two parts an arid academic scholasticism and a brutal pragmatism of power. All this is not unprecedented. The world has gone through such changes as seen before. Such changes signal the solution or bypassing of some problems, the rival of new problems, the death of old questions, the invisible presence of new and unstated questions all around us. Experience, the experience of fascism, Stalinism, racism, and of the end of the contradictory phenomenon of working class affluence within sectors of capitalist economies is breaking in and demanding that we reconstruct our categories. Once again, we are witnessing social being determining social consciousness as experience impinges and presses upon thought. But this time it is not bourgeois ideology, but the scientific consciousness of Marxism, which is breaking under the strain. This is a time for reason to grit its teeth. As the world changes, we must learn to change our language and our terms, but we should never change these without reason. Uh, six, to reply to Althusser, I will deny myself the advantage of fighting this battle upon favorable terrain, that is, the terrain of Marx's and Engels' own writings. While well, in a contest on these terms, almost every skirmish could be won, for repeatedly, Marx and Engels, in the most specific terms, infer the reality of both process and structure inscribed in history, affirm the objectivity of historical knowledge, and pillory idealist modes of thought identical to those of Althusser. I refuse to conduct the argument on this terrain for three reasons. First, while each skirmish might be won, the battle would remain undecided. All that the retreating dogma needs to do is to read Marx even more selectively, discover new silences, repudiate more texts. Second, I have long ceased to be interested in the defense of Marxism as doctrine in this kind of way. Third, although I know these texts, and perhaps even know how to read them in a different way to Althusser's readings, that is, I know them as an apprentice and as a practitioner of historical materialism, have employed them in my practice for many years, have tested them, have been indebted to them, 
and have also on occasion discovered different kinds of silence or inadequacy in them. Although all this is true, I think that the time has gone by for this kind of textual ex exegesis. In this point, and in this point only, I may approach to some agreement with Althusser. For either of us to point to a congruity between our positions and a particular text of Marx can prove nothing as to the validity of the proposition in question. It can only confirm a congruity. In 100 years, the intellectual universe has changed, and even those propositions of Marx which require neither revision nor elucidation were defined in a particular context, and very often in antagonism to particular and now forgotten opponents. And in a new context, and in the face of new and perhaps more subtle objections, these propositions must be thought through and stated once again. This is a familiar historical problem. Everything must be thought through once more. Every term must sit for new examinations. I must delay a little longer over some practical objections. While these present themselves instantly to any practicing historian, a philosopher will no doubt find them trivial. They can be spirited off with an epistemological wand, but the objections should be mentioned. For the descriptions of historical procedures proposed by Popper or by Althusser do not correspond to what mo most historians think they are doing or find themselves to be doing in practice. One finds that some philosophers and more sociologists have a theoretic but uninformed notion of what historical sources, sources are. Thus, one has little sense of self-recognition in the statement that, so, that the so-called sources of history only record such facts as appeared sufficiently interesting to record, nor in the statement, facts are never given, they are always produced. Popper's statement appears to direct attention to the intentionality of the historical actors. Historical evidence comprises only those records which these actors intended to transmit to posterity, and hence imposes their intentions as heuristic rule upon the historian. Hindus and Hearst, who acknowledge themselves to be, in their epistemology, true Althusserians, although more rigorous than their master, shift attention from the genesis of evidence to its appropriation, within a particular theoretical field, by the historian, who produces facts out of something not given. Both statements are half-truths, which is to say they are untrue. By far, the greater part of historical evidence has survived for reasons quite unrelated, unrelated to any intention of the actors to project an image of themselves to posterity. The records of administration, taxation, legislation, religious belief, and practice, the accounts of temples or of monasteries, and the archaeological evidence of their sites. It may be true that the further back we press into the margins of recorded time, more of the evidence becomes subject to Popper's attribution of intention. This is not, however, a property of the evidence which ancient historians and archaeologists have unaccountably overlooked. Indeed, when they consider the earliest Mayan glyphs or cuneiform inscriptions of ancient Babylo Babylonia, an important object of study is precisely the intentions of the recorders, and through this the recovery of their cosmology, their astrology and calendars, their exorcisms and charms, the interests of the recorders. Intended, intended evidence, evidence intentionally provided to posterity, may be studied within the historical discipline as objectively as unintended evidence. That is, the greater part of historical evidence which survives for reasons independent of the actor's intentions. In the first case, <clears throat> the intentions are themselves an object of inquiry, and in both cases historical facts are produced by appropriate disciplines from the evidential facts. But does the confession that, in this disciplined sense, historical facts are produced warrant the half-truth of Heinness and Hearst, that facts are, not, are never given? If they were not, in some sense, given, then historical practice would take place in an empty workshop, manufacturing history, as Althusser and Heinness Hearst would like to do, out of theoretical air, and the very givenness of facts, the determinate properties which they present to the practitioner, constitutes one half of that dialogue which makes up the discipline of the historian. Popper seems to see all historical evidence as the chronicles of kings. Little historical evidence is recorded in this self-conscious sense, and what there is may still be read in Blake's infernal sense, that is, held upside down and shaken 
until it discloses what its authors assumed but did not intend to record. Implicit assumptions and attributes inscribed within the text. Most written sources are of value with little reference to the interest, which led to their being recorded. A marriage settlement between a landed Sion and the daughter of an East India merchant in the 18th century may leave a substantial deposit in a re record office of protracted negotiations, legal deeds, property agreements, even, rarely, an exchange of love letters. The intention of none of the actors was to record interesting facts to some general posterity. It was to unite and to secure property in particular ways, and perhaps also to negotiate a human relationship. The historian will read these materials, and in the light of the questions which he proposes, he may derive from them evidence as to property transactions, as to legal procedures, as to the mediations between landed and mercantile groups, as to particular familial structures and kinship ties, as to the institution of bourgeois marriage, or as to sexual attitudes, none of which evidence the actors intended to disclose, and some of which, perhaps, they might have been horrified to know would come to light. It is the same again and again, all the time. People were taxed, the hearth tax lists are appropriated, not by historians of taxation, but by historical demogra demographers. People were tithed, the terriers are appropriated as evidence by agrarian historians. People were customary tenants or copyholders. Their tenures were enrolled and surrendered in the roles of the manorial court. These essential sources are interrogated by historians again and again, not only in pursuit of new evidence, but in a dialogue in which they propose new questions. So that it seems to a mere historian to be rubbish. Rubbish. As a matter of fact, I know that it is rubbish to assert with Popper that the sources will, as a rule, contain only facts that fit in with preconceived theory. The facts are there, inscribed in the historical record with determinate properties, does not of course entail some notion that these facts disclose their meanings and relationships, historical knowledge of themselves, and independently of theoretical procedures. Few empiricists would argue this, and certainly not Popper, but insofar as this notion survives, it survives at a level of methodology rather than theory, that is, if only the correct method can be designed usually quantitative positivism armed with a computer, then the facts will disclose their meanings independently of any rigorous conceptual exercise. I've argued with the stasis of this kind of empiricist position for many years in my own practice, and I do not mean to argue it all again. Some small part of what Althusser has to say about empiricism when conceived as ideology is just and it is the instant recognition of the obviousness of this justice, both its common sense and its general academic acceptability, which is the usual gate of entry for inexperienced readers, and which beckons them into the interior of his absurd syllogistic world. Instead of rehearsing this old tale once more, let us put it in this way. A historian is entitled in his practice to make a provisional assumption of an epistemological character, that the evidence which he handles has a real, determinate existence, independent of its existence within the form of thoughts, or the forms of thought, that this evidence is witness to a real historical process, and that this process, or some approximate understanding of it, is the object of historical knowledge. Without making such assumptions, he cannot proceed. He must sit in a waiting room outside the philosophy department all his life. To assume thus does not entail the assumption of a whole series of intellectually illiterate notions, such as that facts in involuntarily disclose their own meanings, that answers are supplied independently of questions, etc. We are not talking about prehistory, even if, in some quarters, prehistory survives and even sits robed in chairs. Any serious historian knows that facts are liars, that they carry their own ideological loads, that open-faced, innocent questions may be a mask for exterior attributions, that even the most highly sophisticated, supposedly neutral and empirical research techniques, techniques which would deliver to us history packaged and untouched by the human mind, through the automatic ingestion of the computer, may conceal the most vulgar ideological intrusions. 
So this is a known, or so this is, so this is known. We have been sucking our own eggs for as long as philosophers have been sucking theirs. The historical evidence is there in its primary form, not to disclose its own meaning, but to, in, but to be interrogated by minds trained in, in a discipline of attentive disbelief. The discrete facts may be interrogated in at least six very different ways. One, before any other interrogation can be commenced, the credentials as historical facts must be scrutinized. How were they recorded? For what purpose? Can they be confirmed from adjacent evidence? And so on. This is the bread and butter of the trade. Two, at the level of their own appearance or apparent self-disclosure, but within terms of a disciplined historical inquiry where the facts under interrogation are social or cultural phenomena, we will most often find that the inquiry adduces value-bearing evidence in which those were qualities of self-evaluation inherent in the phenomena, e.g. attitudes towards or within marriage, become the object of study. Three, as more or less inert, neutral, value-free evidences, indices of mortality, wage series, etc., which are then subjected to inquiry in the light of the particular questions, demographic, economic, agrarian, proposed. Such inquiries having their own appropriate procedures, e.g. statistical, designed to limit, although by no means always successfully, the intrusion of ideological attributions. Four, as links in a linear series of occurrences or contingent events, that is, history as it actually happened, but as it can never be fully known, is the construction of a narrative account. Such a reconstruction, however much it may be despised by philosophers, by sociologists, and by an increasing number of contemporary historians who have been frightened by the first two, being an essential constituent of the historical discipline, a prerequisite and, pro and, prom and premise of all historical knowledge, the ground of any objective as distinct from theoretic notion of causation and the indispensable preliminary to the construction of an analytic or structured account, which, ident which identifies structural and causative relations. Even though in the course of such an analysis, the primitive sequential narration will itself undergo radical transformation. Five, as links in a lateral series of social, ideological, economic, political relations, as, for example, this contract is a special case of the general form of contracts at that time. Such contracts were governed by these forms of law. They enforce these forms of obli obligation and subordination, enabling us thereby to recover or infer from many instances, at least a provisional section of a given society in the past. Its characteristic relations of power, domination, kinship, servitude, market relations, and the rest. Six. It may follow from this, if we press the point a little further, that even discrete facts may be interrogated for structure-bearing evidence. This suggestion is more controversial. Many, perhaps most, practicing historians would assent to my first five points. These ways of interrogating evidence belong to the discipline and to its own discourse of the proof. A historical materialist may argue that the structural organization of given societies may be inferred not only from larger evidences, to which we will in time come, but may be inferred as some part, in, in some part, from certain kinds of seemingly discrete facts themselves. Thus a tenure exists as fact, as some Latin formula inscribed upon a court roll, but what that tenure meant cannot be understood independently of an entire structure of tenurial occupancy and attendant law, that is, within a tenurial, tenurial system. Hence, this fact, and very certainly a series of facts of the same order, for certain philosophers of history isolate facts for epistemological scrutiny and lay these on their seminar, seminar table for scrutiny one at a time, whereas historians are always handling facts in bunches and in series carries within it some index towards that system, or at least it should propose to the interrogator an in, in, in indicative question. Similarly, a bill of exchange is an index towards a particular system of credit within which that bill may be negotiated. 
The point has significance, not only in relation to Althusser's notion that structure cannot possibly be inscribed in the real, that theory produces this history, but in relation to Popper's nominalism and methodological individual individualism, which regards all notions of collectivity and of structure as holistic fictions or as abstractions imposed by the observer. But as McIntyre has shown, the army is in Popper's sense an abstract concept. The soldier is a concrete one, a discrete evidence which he will allow. And yet, you cannot characterize an army by referring to the soldiers who belong to it. For to do that, you have to identify them as soldiers. And to do that is already to bring in the concept of an army. For a soldier, je for a soldier just is an individual who belongs to an army. Thus, we see that the characterization of individuals and of classes has to go together. Essentially, these are not two separate tasks. A nominalist, if he were sufficiently strict, would have to describe the copyhold entry and the bill of exchange as passages of a writing upon vellum or paper, and he would be at a loss even to describe writing independently of the concept of language. It is the children of yesterday's nominalists who are now the pupils of Althusser. We will leave it there. I have proposed certain ways of interrogating facts, and no doubt other disciplined and appropriate ways may be proposed. These ways have two common attributes. One, they assume that the historian is engaged in some kind of encounter with an evidence which is not infinitely malleable or subject to arbitrary manipulation that there is a real and significant sense in which the facts are there, and that they are determining, even though the questions which may be proposed are various and will elucidate various replies. Two, they involve disciplined and thoughtful application, and a discipline developed precisely to detect any attempt at arbitrary manipulation. The facts will disclose nothing of their own accord. The historian must work hard to enable them to find their own voices, not the historian's voice, please observe. Their own voices, even if what they are able to say and some part of their vocabulary is determined by the questions which the historian proposes. They cannot speak until they have been asked. I have proposed in the foregoing argument certain practical objections from appearances, i.e. what a historian thinks that he is doing, his self-knowledge of his own procedures. It suggests very different procedures from the, those gestured at by Popper. An Althusser would find, in my account, reprehensible capitulations to empiricist ideology. But I don't intend to prolong this line of defense. It could be greatly extended, greatly elaborated, and we could enter more closely into the historian's workshop. But to offer a defense would be to agree that a serious case has been made out which requires such defense. And this is not so. Neither Popper nor Althusser show any close acquaintance with the historian's procedures, neither understands the nature of historical knowledge. Popper shows the greater curiosity, and therefore his objections deserve the courtesy of some reply. But his repeated confusions between procedures in the experimental sciences and in the historical discipline, and between the different kinds of knowledge which eventuate, defeat his inquiry. Althusser shows no curiosity at all. He does not like the product historical knowledge, and his distaste is perhaps so great that it prevents any kind of nearer acquaintance. He knows that theory could write better history. The knowledge of history is no more historical than the knowledge of sugar is sweet. Thus, Althusser, let us tease this brave epigram a little. It compels assent in an, in, in an inattentive mind because of its obvious common sense, indeed its banality. No knowledge can be the same thing as its object. How true. And we could set up an epistemological mint to coin epigrams of the same order. The knowledge of the French Communist Party is no more communist than the knowledge of water is wet. One could recommend this as a mental distraction during boring railway journeys. Even so, the terms of this banal epigram have been loaded to trick us into a false conclusion. In the first clause, history, historical, we are deliberately pitched into an ambiguity. For historical may mean appertaining to real historical events or evidence, or it may mean appertaining to the historical discipline, the knowledge of history. Althusser intends us, for a rigorous philosopher cannot commit such a solicitism, 
<laughs> innocence. To confuse these two meanings. For if he had proposed the historical knowledge no more appertains to history than sugary knowledge is sweet, we would not at once recognize a revelation of truth. We would suspect, rightly, that we were being got at. And we would then look more critically at the second clause. Why sweet? In what ways do historical and sweet stand in relation to each other? Which permits a logical analogy to be drawn. Historical is a generic definition. It defines very generally a common property of its object, appertaining to the past and not to the present or the future. Sweet isolates one property only from a number of other properties which might propose themselves. Sugar has chemical properties in constitution. It looks brown or white. It is cubed or in powder. It weighs so much and the price of it keeps going up. The property singled out by Althusser, sweetness, concerns not knowledge, but sense perception. Sugar tastes sweet, but no one has ever tasted history, which would perhaps taste bitter. Hence, these two clauses stand only in rhetorical or polemical relation to each other. An honest, an honest balancing of the clauses would have given us this. The knowledge of history is no more historical than the taste of sugar is sweet. This would not have astounded innocent readers with theory's wisdom, nor have sent them running to consult Bacillard and Lacan. Or it could have been proposed in another form again. The knowledge of history is no more historical than the knowledge of sugar is chemical. This would have, this would have brought us closer to an analogy, but then it would not have served so well the purposes of the Althusserian trick, for we would reflect that the knowledge of history is historical. It pertains to the historical discipline in just the same way as the knowledge of sugar is chemical. It finds its definition within chemical science. What Althusser wishes us to receive from his epigram is this. The knowledge of history has got no more to do with real history than the knowledge of sugar has got to do with real sugar. We would then see that we have been offered no brave discovery, but either an epistemological truism thought is not the same thing as its object, or else a proposition both of whose clauses are untrue and whose implications are even a little mad. But we are invited to enter the Althusserian theater through many little verbal turnstiles of this kind. We buy these exalted propositions as our entry fee. All that we need exchange for them is a little of our reason, and once inside the theater we find that there are no exits. We might examine other corrupt propositions in the same way, but I will not expose my readers to the tedium. It is time to ask a more serious question. How is it that Althusser, the rational architect, constructed this theater of the absurd? What problems was Althusser addressing, whose complexities led him onto these agonies of self-mystification? An answer might be proposed at two different levels, ideological and theoretical. We leave aside for the moment the ideological inquiry. First, we will do him the justice of considering his ideas at their own self-evaluation. We will suppose that he arrived at irrationalism by procedures, however faulty, of reason. We have seen that the central fracture which runs through Althusser's thought is a confusion between empirical procedures, empirical controls, and something which he calls empiricism. This fracture invalidates not this or that part of his thought, but his thought as a whole. His epistemological stance prevents him from understanding the two dialogues out of which our knowledge is formed. First, the dialogue between social being and social consciousness, which gives rise to experience. Second, the dialogue between the theoretical organization and all its complexity of evidence on the one hand and the determinate character of its object on the other. As a consequence of the second failure, he cannot understand or must, re or must re misrepresent the character of those empirical procedures which are elaborated within different disciplines, not only to interrogate facts, but to ensure that they reply, not in the interrogator's voice, but in their own voices. As a consequence of the first failure, he cannot understand either the real existential genesis of ideology or the ways in which human praxis contests this ideological imposition and presses against its bonds. Since he ignores both dialogues, he cannot understand neither how historical knowledge arrives as experience, 
nor the procedures of investigation and verification of the historical discipline. The epistemological break with Althusser is a break from disciplined self-knowledge and a leap into the self-generation of knowledge according to its own theoretical procedures. That is, a leap out of knowledge into and, and into theology. He takes this leap because he cannot see any other way out of the compulsive ideological field of genuine empiricism, with its own intellectual complacency and its own self-confirming positivist techniques. Positivism, with its narrowed view of rationality, its acceptance of physics as the paradigm of intellectual activity, its nominalism, its atomism, its lack of hospitality to all general views of the world, this was not invented by Althusser. What he wishes to escape from, the self-enclosed empiricist prison, whose methodologies patrol with statistical linguistic keys at their belts, locking all doors against the admission of structured process, certainly exists. Althusser has scaled its walls, leapt, and now he constructs his own theatre on an adjacent site. Prison and theatre scowl at each other, but a curious thing, both prison and theatre are built from much the same materials, even though the rival architects are sworn to enmity. Viewed from the aspect of historical materialism, the two structures exhibit an extraordinary identity. In certain lights, the two structures appear to echo each other, merge into each other, exemplify the identity of opposites. For both are the products of conceptual stasis, erected stone upon stone from static, ahistorical categories. The critical question concerns less, less epistemology in its relation to discrete facts, although we have already noted certain similarities here, than the epistemological legitim legitimacy of historical knowledge. When considered in its aspect as knowledge of causation, of structure, of the modalities of relationship between social groups or institutions, and of the logic or laws of historical process, it is here that prison and theater join common forces against historical materialism, for both assert this knowledge, as a knowledge of the real, to be epistemologically illegitimate. Althusser cannot bruise empiricism at all, because he starts out from the same premise. He merely breaks at a certain point to an idealist conclusion. Both Popper, A, and Althusser, B, affirm the unknowability of history as a process inscribed with its own causation, since A, any notion of structures and structural mediations entails improper holistic attributions and historicist notions of causation and of process are unverifiable unver by experimental tests. Or since B, the notion that knowledge is already really present in the real object it has to know is an illusion of abstractionist empiricism, mistaking as empirical discoveries its own ideological attributions. What does it matter that Althusser should then leap to the conclusion that knowledge does and should manufacture out of its own theoretical stuff a historical knowledge, which is, in Popper's use of the term, an errant historicism? A real empiricist will be happy with this, for in his eyes Althusser has only confirmed, by his idealist agility, the unverifiable and ideological character of all such pretensions to historical knowledge. Althusser offers a prime example to the seminar discussion, an epilogue to the poverty of historicism. The objections to historical materialism which these antagonists hold in common are, facts, even if knowable, are discrete. They are as raw material impure. Therefore, unstated, by, unstated but assumed, multiples of facts multiply impurities. Historical facts survive as texts in fortuitous or pre-selected ways. They arrive already within an ideological field of a given society in the past and in terms of its own self-evaluation. They are therefore in no way neutral. Historical notions of causation or of structure are highly elaborated theoretical constructions. As such, they are the properties of theory and not of its object, real history. No empirical procedures can identify the category social class. No experiment can be run through to prove the bourgeois character of bourgeois ideology, nor indeed to license such a holistic notion. The vocabulary may be distinct, but the logics of both parties converge. At this point, the philosophers shake hands, kiss each other's cheeks, and part. 
The true empiricist then says, the discrete facts are all that can be known. History is an improper holistic concept to cover a sequence of discrete facts as in fact they succeeded upon each other. If we introduce concepts, we introduce these as models, which assist us to investigate and organize these facts. But we must be clear that these models exist in our heads and not in the history. And we must de develop ever more refined, value-free, and preferably quantitative empirical techniques to enable these facts to disclose themselves as in fact they took place. Whatever happens, I will make sure that no facts escape from their discrete prison cells enter into relationships or hold mass meetings. The exalted Marxist structuralist says, goodbye. Your procedures bore me. I'm going back to my theater to write the script from some better revolutionary history. But the curious thing is that walking off in opposite directions, they end up in much the same place. We will see how this occurs. The sciences, Althusser proposed, have no need for verification from external practices to declare the knowledge they produce to be true. And, we recall, he explicitly nominates historical materialism as one such science. Marx's theoretical practice is the criterion of the truth of the knowledges that Marx produced. It is true that he once says in a rare gesture towards an extra-philosophical world that the successes and failures of this theoretical knowledge constitute pertinent experiments for the theory's reflection on itself and its internal development. The gesture is indistinct. The experiments are not identified. The criteria of success or failure go unspecified. The tone suggests that such experiments are pertinent but inessential. And there is no suggestion that they could, un that they could de determine in any respect the internal development of theory. So that, once again, we find a remarkable congruence between Althusser's idealist structuralism and Popper's weak empiricism. Our two philosophers have been walking on distinct but parallel paths, nodding to each other across the epistemologically illiterate flower beds of the historians. But now the paths converge once again. Popper's radical skepticism has seemed to place us under the guidance of a vigilant logic. Althusser's epistemology directs us to the rigors of theoretical practice. Both seem to dignify theory or logic and to place these above the illusory appearances of objective reality. But the consequence is that both meet, not at the mountain of thought, but staring with bewilderment into the goldfish pond of appearances. Both paths of logic lead into the same bondage of things. Popper disallows what cannot be sensed, tested by experiment, verified. But the interconnections of social phenomena, causation within the historical process, these seem to lie beyond any experimental test. Hence, a weak empiricism leaves us to stare uncomprehendingly at the world's most immediate manifestations, accepting them as what they are because that is what they seem to be. Althusser, on the contrary, is nothing if not vigilant against common sense appearances. He suspects every manifestation, every exterior signal, Theoretical practice is equipped with its own criteria and its own discourse of the proof. But what follows from this? Since theory has only internal means for its own self-verification, it could develop by its own extrapolation in whichever way it pleases. And so, in some highly theoreticist expressions, it does. But we can't in fact get through the business of life in this way, nor can we get through the business of thinking in any substantive manner or about any substantive question. Once we leave epistemology behind and ask questions about our neighbors or about the economy or history or political practice, then some kind of assumptions as to what we are thinking about must be made before we can even begin to think. Since theory disallows any active appropriation of the external world in the only way possible, by active engagement or dialogue with its evidence, then this whole world must be assumed. The raw materials, um, generality one, which arrive, are simply taken as given, and no amount of purely internal processing by generalities two and generalities three can make silk pur purses out of these sows' ears. They remain, however, mocked up and sophisticated exactly as they started off, as assumptions, prejudices, cursory common sense surveys of what everyone knows, which happen to fall conveniently to hand 
for the confirmation, illustration of the prior propositions of the theory. It does not really matter that Popper and Althusser bent in bewilderment over the same pond, see differently colored fish. The bourgeois empirical and Marxist structural notions of what everyone knows are supported upon differing ulterior presupposition, presuppositions. Both have immaculate epistemological reasons for seeing exactly what they came to see. There in the pond, the appearances swim. To Althusser, the fish seem red. To Popper, they are gray. One sees gorgeous worker states swim by. The other sees lurking amidst the weeds, a reticent open society. They must, they must both end with appearances, since both commenced by denying that appearances are the inscription of an, an ulterior reality of, relation, of relationship and practices, whose significance can be disclosed only after arduous interrogation. The appearances will not disclose this significant spontaneity this significance spontaneously and of themselves. Does one need to say this yet again? It is not part of my intention to deny the seductive, self-evident mystification of appearance or to deny our own self-imprisonment within unexamined categories. If we suppose that the sun moves around the earth, this will be confirmed to us by experience every day. If we suppose that a ball rolls downhill through its own innate energy, and will, there is nothing in the appearance of the thing that will disabuse it. If we suppose that bad harvests and famine are caused by the visitation of God upon us for our sins, then we cannot escape from this concept by pointing to drought and late frosts and blight, for God could have visited us through these chosen instruments. We have to fracture old categories and to make new ones before we can explain the evidence that has always been there. But the making and breaking of concepts, the propounding of new hypotheses, the reconstructing of categories, is not a matter of theoretical invention. Anyone can do this. Perhaps the famine was some frolic of the devil, the blight in England a consequence of French witchcraft, or perhaps it was in fulfillment of some ancient curse consequent upon the queen's adultery. Appearance will confirm each one of these hypotheses as well. The devil is well known to be abroad. The French well known to be witches and most queens to be adulterous. And if we suppose the Soviet Union to be a worker state guided by an enlightened Marxist theory or that market forces within capitalist society will always maximize the common good, then in either case, we may stand in one spot all day watching the blazing socialist sun move across blue heavens or the ball of the gross national product roll down the affluent hill, gathering new blessing on blessings on its way. We need not recite this alphabet once again. This alphabet, however, is not some special code understood only by logicians. It is a common alphabet to be mastered at the entry to all disciplines. Nor is it a severe lesson to be administered periodically to empiricists, and only to them. To be sure, there are such empiricists who require this correction, but the lesson has two edges to its blade. Self-generating hypotheses, subject to no empirical control, will deliver us into the bondage of contingency as swiftly, if not more swiftly, than will surrender to the obvious and manifest. Indeed, each error generates and reproduces the other, and both may often be found contained within the same mind. What has, it seems, to be recited afresh is the arduous nature of the engagement between thought and its objective materials, the dialogue, whether as praxis or in more self-conscious intellectual disciplines, out of which all knowledge is one. Uh, seven. There will now be a brief intermission. You may suppose that the lights have been turned up and the ushers are advancing with trays of ice cream. During this intermission, I intend to discuss historical logic. Philosophers or sociologists who have a dislike or a profound disbelief in this subject are advised to withdraw to the foyer and the bar. They may rejoin us at section eight. It is not easy to discuss this theme. Not very long ago, when I was in Cambridge as a guest at a seminar of distinguished anthropologists, when I was asked to justify a proposition I replied that it was validated by historical logic. 
My courteous hosts dissolved into undisguised laughter. I shared in the amusement, of course, but I was also led um, to reflect upon the anthropological significance of the exchange. For it is customary within the rituals of the academy for the practitioners of different disciplines to profess respect, not so much for the findings of each other's discipline as for the authentic credentials of that discipline itself. And if a seminar of historians were to laugh at a philosopher's or anthropologist's very credentials, that is, the logic or discipline central to their practice, this would be regarded as an occasion for offense. And the significance of this exchange was that it was very generally supposed that history was an exception to this rule, that the discipline central to its practice was an occasion for laughter, and that, so far from taking offense, I, as a, as a practitioner, would join in the laughter myself. It is not difficult to see how this comes about. The modes of historical writing are so diverse. The techniques employed by historians are so various. The themes of historical inquiries are so desperate or disparate. And above all, the conclusions are so controversial and so sharply contested within the profession that it is difficult to adduce any disciplinary coherence. And I can well see that there are things within the Cambridge School of History which might occasion anthropological or other laughter. Nevertheless, the study of history is a very ancient pursuit, and it would be surprising if, alone among the sciences and humanities, it had failed to develop its own discipline over several thousand years, that is, its own proper discourse of the proof. And I cannot see what this proper discourse is unless it takes the form of historical logic. This is, I will argue, a distinct logic, appropriate to the historian's materials. It cannot usefully be brought within the same criteria as those of physics, for the reasons adduced by Popper and many others. Thus, history affords no laboratory for experimental verification. It affords evidence of necessary causes, but never, in my view, of sufficient causes. The laws, or as I prefer it, logic or pressures, of social and economic process are continually being broken into by contingencies in ways which would invalidate any rule in the experimental sciences, and so on. But these reasons are not objections to historical logic, nor do they enforce, as Popper supposes, the imputation of historicism upon any notion of history as the record of a unified process, process with its own rationality. They simply illustrate, and on occasion more helpfully define, the conclusion that historical logic is not the same as the disciplinary procedures of physics. Nor can historical logic be subjected to the same criteria as analytic logic, the philosopher's discourse of the proof. The reasons for this lie not in historians' lack of logic, as in their need for a different kind of logic, appropriate to phenomena which are always in movement, which events even in a single moment, contradictory manifestations, whose particular evidences can only find definition within particular contexts, and yet whose general terms of analysis, that is, the questions appropriate to the interrogation of the evidence, are rarely constant and are more often in transition alongside the motions of the historical event. As the object of inquiry changes, so do the appropriate questions. As Sartre has commented, history is not order, it is disorder, a rational disorder. At the very moment when it maintains order, i.e. structure, history is already on the way to undoing it. But disorder of this kind is disruptive of any procedure of analytic logic, which must, as a first condition, handle unambiguous terms and hold them steadily in a single place. We have already noted propensity in philosophers when scrutinizing history's epistemological credentials, to place facts as isolates upon their table instead of the historian's customary materials, the evidence of behavior, including mental, cultural behavior, eventuating through time. When Althusser and many others accuse historians of having no theory, they should reflect that what they take to be innocence or lethargy may be explicit and self-conscious refusal a refusal of static analytic concepts of a logic inappropriate to history. By historical logic, I mean a logical method of inquiry appropriate to historical material, 
materials, designed as far as possible to test hypotheses as to structure, causation, etc., and to eliminate self-confirming procedures, instances, illustrations. The disciplined historical discourse of the proof consists in a dialogue between concept and evidence, a dialogue conducted by successive hypotheses on the one hand and empirical research on the other. The interrogator is historical logic, the interrogative a hypothesis. For example, as to the way in which different phenomena acted upon each other, the respondent is the evidence with its determinate properties. To name this logic is not, of course, to claim that it is always evidenced in every historian's practice or in any historian's practice all of the time. History is not, I think, unique in failing to maintain its own professions. But it is to say that this logic does not disclose itself involuntarily, that the discipline requires arduous preparation, and that 3,000 years of practice have taught us something. And it is to say that it is this logic which, which constitutes the discipline's ultimate court of appeal, not, please note, the evidence by itself, but the evidence interrogated thus. To define this logic fully and to reply to certain of Popper's objections would require writing a different and more academic essay with many instances and illustrations. In addressing myself more particularly to the positions of Althusser, it may be sufficient to offer in defense of historical materialism certain propositions. One, the immediate object of historical knowledge, that is the materials from which this knowledge is adduced, is comprised of facts or evidences which certainly have a real existence, but which are only knowable in many ways, which are and ought to be the concern of vigilant historical procedures. This proposition we have already discussed. Two, historical knowledge is in its nature, a provisional and incomplete, but not therefore untrue, b selective, but not therefore untrue, c limited and defined by the questions proposed to the evidence and the concepts informing those questions, and hence only true within the field so defined. In these respects, historical knowledge may depart from other paradigms of knowledge when subjected to epistemological inquiry. In this sense, I am ready to agree that the attempt to designate history as a science has always been unhelpful and confusing. If Marx and even more Engels sometimes fell into this error, then we may apologize but we should not confuse the claim with their actual procedures. Marx certainly knew also that history was a muse and that the humanities construct knowledges. Three, historical evidence has determinate properties. While any number of questions may be put to it, only certain questions will be appropriate. While any theory of historical process may be proposed, all theories are false, which are not in conformity with the evidence's determinations. Herein lies the disciplinary court of appeal. In this sense, it is true, we may agree here with Popper, that while historical knowledge must always fall short of positive proof of the kinds appropriate to experimental science, false historical knowledge is generally subject to disproof. Four, it follows from these propositions that the relation between historical knowledge and its object cannot be understood in any terms which suppose one to be a function inference from, disclosure, abstraction, attribution, or illustration of the other. Interrogative and response are mutually determining, and the relation can be understood only as a dialogue. Four further propositions may not be presented at somewhat greater length, or may now be, sorry, may now be presented at somewhat greater length. Five. The object of historical knowledge is real history, whose evidences must necessarily be incomplete and imperfect. To suppose that a present, by moving into a past, thereby changes its ontological status, is to misunderstand both the past and the present. The palpable reality of our own, already passing present, can in no way be changed because it is already becoming the past for posterity. To be sure, posterity cannot interrogate it in all the same ways. To be sure, you and I, as experiencing instants and actors within our present, will survive only as certain evidences of our acts or thoughts. While historians may take a decision to select from this evidence and to write a history of discrete aspects of the whole, a biography, the history of an institution, a history of fox hunting, etc., the real object remains unitary. 
The human past is not an aggregation of discrete histories, but a unitary sum of human behavior, each aspect of which was related in certain ways to others, just as the individual actors were related in certain ways, by the market, by relations of power and subordination, etc. Insofar as these actions and relations gave rise to changes, which become the object of rational inquiry, we may define this sum as historical process that is, practices ordered and structured in rational ways. While this definition arrives in response to the question asked, this does not invent process. We must take our stand here against Goldbin and with Bloch. The finished processes of historical change with their intricate causation actually occurred, and historiography may falsify or misunderstand, but can't in the least degree modify the past's ontological status. The objective of the historical discipline is the attainment of that history's truth. Each age or each practitioner may propose new questions to the historical evidence or may bring new levels of evidence to light. In this sense, history, when considered as the products of historical inquiry, will change and ought to change with the preoccupations of each generation or, as it may be, each sex, each nation, each social class. But this by no means implies that the past events themselves change with each questioner, or that the evidence is indeterminate. Disagreements between historians may be of many kinds, but they remain as mere exchanges of attitude or exercises of ideology, unless it is agreed that they are conducted within a common discipline whose pursuit is objective knowledge. To this proposition, it is necessary to add a writer. When we speak of the intelligibility of history, we may mean the understanding of the rationality, of causation, etc., of historical process. Uh, this is an objective knowledge disclosed in a dialogue with determinate evidence, but we may also imply the significance of that past, its meaning to us. This is an evaluative and subjective judgment, and to such interrogatives, the evidence can supply no answers. This does not entail the conclusion that any such exercise is improper. We may agree with Popper that each generation, each historian is entitled to express a point of view, or with Kolakowski that we are entitled to attribute such imminent intelligi intelligibility to history as an act of faith, provided that we are clear that this rests not upon scientific procedures, but upon a choice of values. We may agree not only that such judgments as to the meaning of history are a proper and important activity, a way in which today's actors identify their values and their goals, but that it is also an inevitable activity. That is, the preoccupations of each generation, sex, or class must inevitably have a normative content, which will find expression in the questions proposed to the evidence. But this in no way calls in question the objective determinacy of the evidence. It is simply a statement as to the complexity, not just of history, but of ourselves, who are simultaneously valuing and rational beings. A complexity which enters into all forms of social self-knowledge, and which requires in all disciplines procedural safeguards. It is exactly within historical logic that such attributions of meaning, if covert and improper, are exposed. It is in this way that historians find each other out. A feminist historian will say, or ought to say, that this history book is wrong, not because it was written by a man, but because the historian neglected contiguous, contiguous, can, can, yet, contiguous evidence or proposed conceptually inadequate questions. Hence, a masculine meaning or bias was imposed upon the answers. It is the same with the somewhat in, intemperate arguments which I and my Marxist colleagues often provoke within the academic profession. <clears throat> the appeal is not, or is rarely, to a choice of values, but to the logic of the discipline, and if we deny the determinate properties of the object, then no discipline remains. But I cannot leave this writer while giving the impression that the attribution of meaning as value's significance is only a matter for, for regret, a consequence of human fallibility. I think it to be greatly more important than that. I am not in the least embarrassed by the fact that, when presenting the results of my own historical research, I offer value judgments as to past process. 
whether openly and strenuously, or in the form of ironies or asides. This is proper in one part because the historian is examining individual lives and choices, and not only historical eventuation process. And while we may not attribute value to process, the same objections do not arise with the same force when we are considering the choices of individuals whose acts and intentions may certainly be judged as they were judged by contemporaries within the due and relevant historical context. But this is only a special case of a more general question. Only we who are now living can give a meaning to the past, but that past has always been, among other things, the result of an argument about values. In recovering that process and showing how causation actually eventuated, we must, insofar as the discipline can enforce, hold our own values in abeyance. But once this history has been recovered, we are at liberty to offer our judgment upon it. Such judgment must itself be under historical controls. The judgment must be appropriate to the materials. It is pointless to complain that the bourgeoisie have not been communitarians, or that the levelers did not introduce an, anar an anarcho-syndicalist society. What we may do, rather, is identify with certain values which past actors upheld and reject others. We may give our vote for Winstanley and for Swift. We may vote against Walpole and Sir Edwin Chadwick. Our vote will change nothing, and yet in another sense it may change everything. For we are saying that these values and not those other values are the ones which make this history meaningful to us, and that these are the values which we intend to enlarge and sustain in our own present. If we succeed, then we reach back into history and endow it with our own meanings. We shake, shift by the hand. We endorse in our present the values of Win Win Winstonley and ensure that the low and ruthless kind of opportunism which distinguished the politics of Walpole is aboard. In the end, we also will be dead and our own lives will lie inert within the finished process. Our intentions assimilated within a past event which we never intended. What we may hope is that the men and women of the future will reach back to us, will affirm and renew our meanings, and make our history intelligible within their own present tense. They alone will have the power to select from the many meanings offered by a quarreling present and to transmute some part of our process into their progress. For progress is a concept either meaningless or worse, when imputed as an attribute to the past, and such attributions may probably properly be denounced as historicist, which can only acquire a meaning from a particular position in the present, a position of value in search of its own genealogy. Such genealogies exist within the evidence. There have been men and women of honor, courage, and foresight and there have been historical movements informed by these qualities. But in spite of Goldman's authority, we must argue not that historical reality changes from epoch to epoch with modifications in the hierarchy of values, but that the meaning which we attribute to that reality changes in this way. This rider to my proposition has taken us a little out of our way. The proposition concerned the objectivity of real history we seem to return again and again to the narrowing circuits of this epistemological whirlpool. Let us try to advance. Six, the investigation of history as process, as eventuation on rational disorder, entails notions of causation, of contradiction, of mediation, and of the systematic organization, sometimes structuring, of social, political, economic, and intellectual life. These elaborate notions belong within historical theory, are refined within this theory's procedures, are thought within thought, but it is untrue that they belong only within theory. Each notion or concept arises out of empirical engagements, and however abstract the procedures of its self-interrogation, it must then be brought back into an engagement with the determinate properties of the evidence and argue its case before vigilant judges in history's court of appeal. It is, and in a most critical sense, a, a question of dialogue once more. In the sense that a thesis, the concept or hypothesis, is brought into relation with its antithesis, 
a theoretical objective determinacy and a synthesis, historical knowledge. Results we might call this the dialectics of historical knowledge. Or we might have done so before dialectics was rudely snatched out of our grasp and made into the plaything of scholasticism. Historical practice is above all engaged in this kind of dialogue with an argument between received, inadequate, or ideologically informed concepts or hypotheses on the one hand, and fresh or inconvenient evidence on the other. But the elaboration of new hypotheses with the testing of these hypotheses against the evidence, which may involve interrogating existing evidence in new ways or renewed research to confirm or disprove the new notions with discarding those hypotheses which fall, which fail these tests and refining or revising those which do in the light of this engagement. Insofar as a notion finds endorsement from the evidence, then one has every right to say that it does exist out there in the real history. It does not, of course, actually exist like some plasma adhering to the facts or as some invisible kernel within the shell of appearances. What we are saying is that the notion, concept, hypothesis as to causation has been brought into a disciplined dialogue with the evidence and it has been shown to work. That is, it has not been disproved by contrary evidence and that it successfully organizes or explains hitherto inexplicable evidence. Hence, it is an adequate, although approximate representation of the causative sequence or rationality of these events and it conforms within the logic of the historical discipline with a process which did in fact eventuate in the past. Hence it exists simultaneously both as a true knowledge and as an adequate representation of an actual property of those events. Seven, historical materialism differs from other interpretive orderings of historical evidence, not or not necessarily in any epistemological premises but in its categories, its characteristic hypotheses and attendant procedures, and in the avowed conceptual kinship between these and the concepts elaborated by Marxist practitioners in other disciplines. I do not see Marxist historiography as being attendant on some general corpus of Marxism as theory located somewhere else, perhaps in philosophy. On the contrary, if there is common ground for all Marxist practices, then it must be where Marx located it himself, in historical materialism. This is the ground from which all Marxist theory arises, into which it must return in the end. In saying this, I am not saying that Marxist historians are not indebted for certain concepts to a general Marxist theory, which extends itself towards and draws upon the findings of Marxists at work in other fields. This is evidently the case. Our work goes on in a continual exchange I am disputing the notion that this is a theory which has some home independently of these practices, a self-validating textual home, or a home in the wisdom of some Marxist party, or a home in a purified theoretical practice. The homeland of Marxist theory remains where it has always been, the real human object and all its manifestations, past and present, which, which object, however, cannot be known in one theoretical coup d'oeil doi doi <laughs> uh, so theory could swallow reality in one gulp but only through discrete disciplines informed by unitary concepts these disciplines or practices meet at each other's borders exchange concepts converse correct each other's errors philosophy may and must monitor refine and assist the conversation but let philosophy attempt to abstract the concepts from the practices and build from them a home for theory independently of these. And far removed from any dialogue with theory's object, then we will have the theater of Althusser. It follows that if Marx's concepts, that is, concepts developed by Marx and within the Marxist tradition, differ from other interpretive concepts in historical practice, and if they are found to be more true or adequate to explanation than others, this will be because they stand up better to the test of historical logic and not because they are derived from a true theory outside of this discipline. As in any case, they were not, insofar as I am myself deeply indebted for certain concepts to Marx's own practice. 
I refuse to evade responsibility by falling back upon his authority, or to escape from criticism by leaping from the Court of Appeal. For historical knowledge, this court lies within the discipline of history and nowhere else. Appeal may take two forms, A. Evidential, which has been sufficiently discussed, and B. Theoretical, to the coherence, adequacy, and consistency of the concepts, and to their congruence with the knowledge of adjacent disciplines. But both forms of appeal may be conducted only within the vocabulary of historical logic. The court has been sitting in judgment upon historical materialism for 100 years, and it is continually being adjourned. The adjournment is in effect a tribute to the robustness of the tradition and that long internal and that long interval the cases against a hundred other interpretive systems have been upheld and the culprits have disappeared downstairs that the court has not yet found decisively in favor of historical materialism is not only because of the ideological parti pre of certain of the judges although there is plenty of that but also because of the provisional nature of the explanatory concepts, the actual silences or absent mediations within them, the primitive and re unrecon or unreconstructed character of some of the categories, and the inconclusive determinacy of the evidence. 8. My final proposition brings a fundamental reservation to bear upon Althusserian epistemology and also upon certain structuralisms or functional systems e.g. Parsonian sociology, which periodically attempt to overrun the historical discipline. Certain critical, certain critical categories and concepts employed by historical materialism can only be understood as historical categories, that is, as categories or concepts appropriate to the investigation of process, the scrutiny of facts, which, even in the moment of interrogation, change their form, or retain their form but change their meanings, or dissolve into other facts, concepts appropriate to the handling of evidence, not capable of static conceptual representation, but only as manifestation or as contradiction. The construction of historical concepts is not, of course, a special privilege peculiar to historical materialism. Such concepts arise within the historian's common discourse or are developed with adjacent disciplines. The classic concept of the crisis of subsistence proposes a rational sequence of events, as, for example, poor harvest dearth, rising mortality, the consumption of next year's seed, a second poor harvest, extreme dearth, a peak in mortality, accompanied by epidemic, a sharply rising con consumption rate, the concept of the familial development cycle proposes a particular three-generational sequence within the same peasant household. Modified by the particular conditions of land tenure and inheritance practice, these concepts, which are generalized by logic from many examples, are brought to bear upon the evidence, not so much as models, but rather as expectations. They do not impose a rule, but they hasten and facilitate the interrogation of the evidence even though it is often found that each case departs in this or that particular from the rule. The evidence in the real event is not rule governed and yet it could not be understood without the rule, to which it offers its own irregularities. This provokes impatience in some philosophers and even sociologists who consider that a concept with such elasticity um, is not a true concept and a rule is not a rule unless the evidence conforms to it and stands to attention in one place. Historical concepts and rules are often of this order. They display extreme elasticity and allow for great irregularity. The historian appears to be evading rigor as he disappears into the largest generalizations at one moment, while at the next moment he disappears into the particularities of the qualifications in any special case. This provokes distrust and even laughter within other disciplines. Historical materialism employs concepts of equal generality and elasticity, exploitation, hegemony, class struggle, and as expectations rather than as rules, and even categories which appear to offer less elasticity, feudalism, capitalism, the bourgeoisie, 
appear in historical practice, not as ideal types fulfilled in historical evolution, but as whole families of special cases, families which include adopted orphans and the children of typological mis mis miscegenation. History knows no regular verbs. It is the misfortune of Marxist historians, it is certainly our special misfortune today, that certain of our concepts are common currency in a water intellectual universe, or adopted in other disciplines, which impose their own logic upon them and reduce them to static ahistorical categories. No historical category has been more misunderstood, tormented, transfixed, and dehistoricized than the category of social class. A self-defining historical formation, which men and women make out of their own experience of struggle, of which men are not the makers, but the vectors. Not only have Althusser and Palancis done Marxist history this wrong, but they then complain that history, from whose, from whose arms they abducted this concept, has no proper theory of class. What they and many others of every ideological hue misunderstand is that it is not and never has been the business of history to make up this kind of inelastic theory. And if Marx himself had one supreme methodological priority, it was precisely to destroy unhistorical theory mongering of this kind. History is not a factory for the manufacture of grand theory, like some concord of the global air, nor is it an assembly line for the production of midget theories in series. Nor yet is it some gigantic experimental station in which theory of foreign manufacture can be applied, tested, and confirmed. That is not its business at all. Its business is to recover, to explain, and to understand its object, real history. The theories which historians adduce are directed to this objective within the terms of historical logic, and there is no surgery which can transplant foreign theories like unchanged organs into other static conceptual logics or vice versa. Our, object our objective is historical knowledge. Our hypotheses are advanced to explain this particular social formation in the past, that particular sequence of causation. Our knowledge, we hope, is not thereby imprisoned within that past. It, it helps us to know who we are, why we are here, what human possibilities have been disclosed, and as much as we can know of the logic and forms of social process. Some part of that knowledge may be theorized, less, less as rule than as expectation, and exchanges may and should take place with other knowledges and theories. But the exchange involves vigilance as the theoretical coin of, of one discipline is translated into the currency of another. Philosophy ought not to stand on every frontier like a huckster offering spurious universal banknotes current in all lands. It might instead operate a watchful bureau to change. Those propositions of historical materialism which bear upon the relation between social being and social consciousness, upon the relations of production and their determinations upon modes of exploitation, class struggle, ideology, or upon capitalist social and economic formations, are at one pole of their dialogue derived from the observation of historical eventuation over time. This observation is not of discrete facts, seriatim, but of sets of facts with their own regularities, uh, of the repetition of certain kinds of event, of the congruence of certain kinds of behavior within differing contexts, in short, of the evidences of systematic social formations and of common logic of process. Such historical theories as arise, not of themselves, but at the other pole of the dialogue, by arduous conceptualization, cannot be tested, as is often supposed, by calling a halt to process, freezing history, and taking a static geological section, which will show capitalism or class hierarchies at any given moment of time as an elaborated structure. In investigating history, we are not, or in investigating history, we are not flicking through a series of stills each of which shows us a moment of social time transfixed into a single eternal pose. For each one of these stills is not only a moment of being, of being, but also a moment of becoming. And even within each seemingly static section, there will be found contradictions and liaisons, dominant and subordinate elements, declining or ascending energies. 
Any historical moment is both a, a result of prior process and an index towards the direction of its future flow. There are well-known difficulties both in explaining historical process and in verifying any explanation. History itself is the only possible laboratory for experiment and our only experimental equipment is historical logic. If we press improper analogies with experimental sciences, we will soon find out that the whole business is unsatisfactory. History never affords the conditions for identical experiments. And while by comparative procedures, we may observe somewhat similar experiments in different national laboratories, the rise of the nation state industrialization, we can never reach back into those laboratories, impose our own conditions and run the experiment through once again. But such analogies have never been helpful. The fact that the difficulties of historical explanation are immense should surprise no one. We inhabit the same element ourselves, a present becoming a past, a human element of habit, need, reason, will, illusion, and desire, and we should know it to be made up of obstinate stuff. And yet there is one sense in which the past improves upon the present, for history remains its own laboratory of process and eventuation. A static section may show us certain elements, A, B, and C, in mutual interrelationship or contradiction. Eventuation over time will show us how these relationships were lived through, fought out, resolved, and how A, B, C gave rise to D. And this eventuation will, in turn, throw light back upon the ways in which the elements were previously related in the strength of, in the strength of the contradiction. In this sense, the eventuation confirms or disproves, hardens or qualifies the explanatory hypothesis. This is a bad laboratory in one sense, that the event took place in this way may be the consequence of some contingent element, X, overlooked in the explanation. Thus, ABC plus X may have eventuated in one way, D, but ABC plus Y would have eventuated differently, E. And to overlook this is to fall into the familiar error of arguing post hoc ergo propter, propter hoc. This is a besetting problem of all historical explanation. And philosophers who have glanced at our procedures have made a hearty meal of it. But they overlook the fact that in another sense, history is a good laboratory. Because process, eventuation, is present within every moment of the evidence. Testing every hypothesis is in an outcome, providing results for every human experiment that has ever been conducted. Our logic is fallible, but the very multiplicity of experiments and their congruence to each other limit the dangers of error. The evidence as to any particular episode may be imperfect. There will be plenty of gaps when we consider eventuation in the form of discrete facts in series. But at least in less distant history, sufficient evidence survives to disclose the logic of this process. Its outcome, the characteristic social formations, and how ABC in fact gave rise to D. We may make this point more clear if we consider a, pro a problem, not from the past, but from the historical present. The Soviet Union is such a problem. In order to explain one aspect of this problem, who holds power and in what direction is political process tending, a number of explanatory hypotheses are proposed. For example, the Soviet Union is a worker state, perhaps with certain deformities, capable of ascendant self-development without any severe internal struggle or rupture of continuity. All shortcomings are capable of self-reflection or self-correction, owing to the guidance of a proletarian party informed by Marxist theory and hence blessed with the know-how of history. Or the Soviet Union is a state in which power has fallen into the hands of a new bureaucratic class whose interest it is to secure its own privileges and continue tenure of power, a class which will only be overthrown by another proletarian revolution. Or the Soviet state is the instrument of a historically specific form of forced industrialization, which has thrown up an arbitrary and contingent collocation of ruling groups, which may now be expected to be the agents of the modernization of Soviet society bringing it into tardy and imperfect conformity with that true model of modern man, the United States. Or, which is closer to my own view, the Soviet state can only be understood with the aid of the concept of parasitism, and whether or not its ruling groups harden into a bureaucratic class, or whether, or whether episodic 
reform can be imposed upon them by pressures of various kinds, from the needs and resistances of workers and farmers, from intellectual dissenters, and from the logic arising from their own inner contradictions, factional struggles, and incapacity to perform essential functions, etc., remains historically an unfinished and indeterminate question, which may be precipi precip precipitated into one or another more fully determined direction by contingencies. There is a real and important sense in which these or other hypotheses will only find confirmation or refutation in dipraxis of eventuation. The experiment is still being run through, and much as Althusser dislikes Engels's Mancunian colloquialism, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. The result, when brought within the scrutiny of future historians, may appear to confirm one hypothesis, or may propose a new hypothesis altogether. Any such confirmation, if it should arise, can never be more than approximate. History is not rule-governed, and it knows no sufficient causes, and if future historians suppose otherwise, they would be falling into the error of post hoc ergo propter hoc. The hypotheses, or the blend of ideology and of self-knowledge, which we or the Soviet people adopt in this present, will themselves enter as an element within eventuating process. And if some different contingency had impinged upon these elements, for example, if a third world war had arisen from the Cuba crisis, then all would have eventuated differently. The military and security forces would have been immensely strengthened and a different hypothesis might then appear to have explanatory force. But this is not as devastating a qualification as may at first appear, for it will be as matters eventuate as the experiment works out, which will afford to future historians immense additional insight as to the critical relations structuring Soviet society, which underlie the appearances of our historical present. The result will afford to them additional insight into which formidable elements, perhaps the state ideology of Marxism, Leninism, were to prove in the event to be fragile and in decline, and which inarticulate, loosely structured elements prefigured an emergent opposition. The historians of the future who will know how things turned out will have a powerful aid to understanding, not why they had to turn out in that way, but why in fact they did. That is. That is, they will observe in the laboratory of the events the evidence of determination, not in its sense as rule-governed law, but in its sense of the setting of limits and the exerting of pressures. And today's historians stand in exactly the same position in relation to the historical past, which is simultaneously the object of investigation and its own experimental laboratory. That historical explanation cannot deal in absolutes and cannot adduce sufficient causes greatly irritates some simple and impatient souls. They suppose that, since historical explanation cannot be all, it is therefore nothing. It is no more than a consecutive phenomenological narration. This is a silly mistake, for historical explanation discloses now, or discloses not how history must have eventuated, but why it eventuated in this way and not in other ways. That process is not arbitrary, but has its own regularity and rationality. That certain kinds of event, political, economic, cultural, have been related, not in any way one likes, but in particular ways and within determinate fields of possibility. That certain social formations are not governed by law, nor are they the effects of a static structural theorem, but are characterized by, de by determinate relations and by a particular logic of process, and so on and a great deal more. Our knowledge may not satisfy some philosophers, but it is enough to keep us occupied. We have left our eighth position behind, and we may now rehearse it once again. The categories appropriate to the investigation of history are historical categories. Historical materialism is distinguished from other interpretive systems by its stubborn consistency. Alas, a stubbornness which has sometimes been doctrinaire in elaborating such categories and by its articulation of these within a conceptual totality. This totality is not a finished theoretical truth or theory, but neither is it a make-believe model. It is a developing knowledge, albeit a provisional and approximate knowledge with many silences and impurities. The development of this knowledge takes place both within theory and within practice. It arises from a dialogue 
and its discourse of the proof is conducted within the terms of historical logic. The actual operations of this logic do not appear step by step on every page of a historian's work. If they did, history books would exhaust all patience. But this logic should be implicit in each empirical engagement and explicit in the way in which the historian positions himself before the evidence and in the questions proposed. I do not claim that historical logic is always as rigorous or as self-conscious as it ought to be, nor that our practice often matches our professions. I claim only that there is such logic and that not, and that not all of us are wet behind the ears. Eight, the intermission is now over. Philosophers and sociologists are requested to cease chatting in the aisles and to resume their places in the empty seats around me. The auditorium is darkening. I, a hush falls in the theater and Althusser resumes the stage. The great impres impresario has returned refreshed and in an uncustomary mood of geniality. He announces that the heavy epistemological drama will be suspended. We have done with history and tragedy for the time. Instead, he will present a burlesque sketch of his own composition, a little influenced by Sade. Sade. A superannuated clown with pretensions to epistemological respectability will be brought in. The, audi the audience must please keep straight faces at first. Quizzed, exposed, mocked, tormented, and finally booted and hooted off the stage. From the wings he drags on, gouty, dim-eyed, a fool's cap upon his eyes, that poor old duffer, Frederick Engels. The sketch starts a little slowly and with subtlety. Engels is interrogated about parallelograms of forces, about individual wills and historical resultants. He is convicted of tautology. He hangs his head. He is forgiven. I am quite prepared to ignore Engels' reference to nature. He is convicted of worse, confusion, of association with, with bourgeois ideology. He hangs his head again, is sharply reprimanded, a futile construction, but then is given a toffee. He has genial theoretical intuitions. He smiles and nods to the audience, little expecting what is to follow. The dialogue is a little difficult to follow, especially as the clown is not allowed to respond. We will take the script home and comment on it later. Now the whip is brought on. When in anti during Engels writes that political economy is essentially historical science because it deals with material which is historical, that is constantly changing, he touches the exact spot of the ambiguity. The word historical may either fall towards the Marxist concept or towards the ideological concept of history, according to whether this word designates the object of knowledge of a theory of history or, on the contrary, the real object of which this theory gives the knowledge. We have every right to say that the theory of Marxist political economy derives from the Marxist theory of history as one of its regions, but we might also think, i.e. Engels' words might allow us to suppose that the theory of political economy is affected even in its concepts by the peculiar quality of real history, its material, which is changing. The down rushes us into this latter interpretation in a number of astonishing texts, which introduce history in the empiricist ideological sense, even into Marx's categories, absurdity of absurdities. He even says that it is wrong to expect fixed cut to measure once and for all applicable definitions in Marx's works. And he argues, it is self-evident that where things and their interrelations are conceived, not as fixed, but as changing their mental reflections, the concepts are likewise subject to change and transformation. Worse still, he is caught with his buttocks exposed in an obscene anti-theoretic theoreticist posture. To science, definitions are worthless because always inadequate. The only real definition is the development of the thing itself. But this is no longer a definition. To know and show all forms of life, we must examine all forms of life and present them in their interconnection. 
but that was a quote from Elphuser. Thus, the old buffer is exposed in an astonishing relapse into empiricist ideology. He is convicted of supposing that the necessary concepts of any theory of history are affected in their conceptual substance by the properties of the real object. In this way, Engels applies to the concepts of the theory of history a coefficient of mobility borrowed directly from the concrete empir empirical, empirical sequence from the ideology of history, transposing the real concrete into the thought concrete and the historical, a real change into the concept itself. That sentence was um, another quote from Althusser. But this time, the old clown's abject apologies earn him no remission of punishment. The boot and the whip fall inexorably, for it turns out that he is not a clown at all. He is a cunning fellow, masquerading in clown's motley, hoping to pass off as jests the malice of his true nature. This nature is fully revealed at the very end of the act, for in March, 19, er, in March 1895, five months before his death, the old man sheds all disguises and is found writing to Conrad Schmidt. The objections you raise to the law of value apply to all concepts regarded from the standpoint of reality. The identity of thinking and being to express myself in Hegelian fashion everywhere coincides with your example of the circle and the polygon. Or the two of them, the concept of a thing and its reality, run side by side like two asymptotes, always approaching each other yet never meeting. This difference between the two is the very difference which prevents the concept from being directly and immediately reality, and reality from being immediately its own concept. Because a concept has the essential nature of that concept and cannot therefore prima facie directly coincide with reality, from which it must first be abstracted, it is something more than a fiction, unless you are going to declare all the results of thought fictions, because reality corresponds to them only very circuitously and even one only with asymptomatic approximation. Now at last the sketch is brought to a close. The old man is booted whimpering into the wings. The curtain is rung down. Engels's letter is astounding despite the banality of its obviousness. Engels's blunders would mark Marxist philosophical theory and with what a mark, the mark of the empiricist theory of knowledge. On every side of me, the audience bursts into rapturous applause. What a clever sketch. It is a pity it was so brief, perhaps because, now it has been shown to us, one can think of other earlier lines of this same clown which could have been turned to equal account. There was, for example, that malicious, decidedly not innocent assault on philosophy itself in Ludwig Feuerbach, which Althusser has no doubt not forgiven, and for which he is now taking his revenge. The proof of the Marxist conception of history, Engels unashamedly avowed, is to be found in history itself. This conception, however, puts an end to philosophy in the realm of history, such as the dialectical conception of nature made all natural philosophy both unnecessary and impossible. It is no longer a question anywhere of inventing interconnections from out of our brains, but of discovering them in the facts. For philosophy, which has been expelled from nature and history, there remains only the realm of pure thought, so far as it is left. The theory of the laws of the thought process itself, logic and dialectics. What self-restraint in Althusser not to flagellate these notions, discovering them in, fa in the facts. But the comedy would have been over facile, or, there's, or there is that other astonishing text in anti during if we deduce world schematism not from our minds, but only through our minds from the real world, deducing the basic principles of being from what it is, we need no philosophy for this purpose, but positive knowledge of the world and of what happens in it. And what this yields is also not philosophy, but positive science. How does it happen that no record of Marx's explosion before this apostasy has been recorded? Or we could have browsed more generally through the old clown's leader letters, even that letter to Schmidt, which Althusser had singled out for corrective treatment, does not end there. It goes on, and if anything gets worse. All of Marx's economic concepts, the general rate of profit, the law of wages, rent, indeed economic laws in general, 
None of them has any reality except as approximation, tendency, average, and not as immediate reality. It is the same for historical concepts also. Did feudalism ever correspond to its concept, founded in the Kingdom of the West Franks, further developed in Normandy by the Norwegian conquerors? Its formation continued by the French Norsemen in England and Southern Italy. It came nearest to its concepts. In Jerusalem, in the Kingdom of a Day, which in the Assizes de Jerusalem left behind it the most classic expression of the feudal order. Was this order therefore a fiction because it only achieved a short-lived existence and full classical form in Palestine, and even that mostly only on paper? And the same epistemological irresponsibility is displayed even with reference to the present and to the future. For Engels tell Schmidt that the laws of value and of profit both only attain their most complete approximate realization on the presupposition that capitalist production has been everywhere established. Society reduced to the modern classes of landowners, capitalists, industrialists, and merchants and workers. All intermediate stages, however, having been got rid of. This does not exist even in England and never will exist. We shall not let it get so far as that. What a solicism, what is solicism to introduce into the discourse of the proof a category. We, the agency of an old man and his imaginary friends, derive from a different region and a suspect region too, does it smack of humanism and for which the theory has made no provision. But for we are stern critics, the dramatist might surely have enriched his sketch in other ways. Why only one clown? Why not two clowns, a thin one stooping with age and a fatter one, more robust and youthful, as foils to each other? Let us drag from the wings, perspiring, tormented by carbuncles, the super clown, fatty marks. He makes his bow and recites from an early letter to P.V. Anenkov, December 1846, and after the so-called epistemological break, a criticism of Proudhon. He has not perceived that economic categories are only the abstract expressions of these actual relations and only remain true while these relations exist. He therefore falls into the error of the bourgeois economists who regard these economic categories as eternal and not as historic laws, which are only laws for a particular historical development. Instead, therefore, of regarding the political economic categories as abstract expressions of the real transitory historic social relations, Monsieur Proudhon only sees, thanks to a mystic transposition, the real relations as embodiments of these abstractions. These abstractions, therefore, are formulae which have been slumbering in the heart of God, the Father, since the beginning of the world. Categories, then, are historic and transitory products, whereas, according to Proudhon, they and not men make history. The abstraction, the category taken as such, i.e. apart from men and their material activities, is, of course, immortal, unmoved, unchangeable. It is only one form of the being of pure reason, which is only another way of saying that the abstraction as such is abstract and admirable an admirable tautology. And writing to Schweitzer nearly 20 years later, Marx returned to the critique of Proudhon in exactly the same terms. He shares the illusions of speculative philosophy in his treatment of the economic categories, for instead of conceiving them as the theoretical expression of historic relations of production corresponding to a particular stage of development in material production, he garbles them into pre-existing eternal ideas. But let us cease to imagine improvements in the sketch. Let us sit down and examine it as it has been presented. Um, nine. What is all this about? It would be simple to dismiss the whole argument on the grounds that Althusser has proposed a spurious question, necessitated by his prior epistemological confusions. This is, in fact, a large part of the answer, and a sufficient answer to Althusser, and it can be briefly stated. He has proposed a pseudo-opposition. On the one hand, he presents theory, and capital itself, 
as occurring exclusively in knowledge and concerning exclusively the necessary order of appearance and disappearance of concepts. In the discourse of the scientific proof. On the other side, across from his rather grand project, he presents the petty projects of empiricism, which constitute ideology. Engels is trying to muddle the two, which would be disastrous. The mark of the empiricist beast, since the discourse of the proof must, as a prerequisite, demand the fixity and unambigu unambiguity of concepts. But we have already seen that Althusser's notion of empiricism is false, and that it imposes the canons of philosophy upon quite different procedures and disciplines. We need follow this argument no further. Even within its own terms, Althusser's argument offers self-contradictions and evasions. Thus he tells us that we have every right to say that the theory of Marxist political economy derives from the Marxist theory of history as one of its regions. But he also tells us that the theory of history, even now, 100 years after capital, does not exist in any real sense. So that in one of its regions, Marx's political theory was derived from an absent theory. This goes along with the evasion of the evident fact that in other of its regions, this political economy was derived very directly from empirical engagement, either directly from the mountain of blue books, etc., etc., to which Marx Marx pays such generous tribute, or less directly, by intense and critical scrutiny of the empirically based studies of other writers. So that Althusser set out with a bad argument, and he rigged the terms to make it look better. Engels would appear to have been arguing two propositions. First, the inherently approximate nature of all our concepts, and especially of those necessarily fixed concepts which arise from and are brought to the analysis of changing, unfixed social development. This may be a banality in its obviousness to a philosopher who supposes that it is only another way of saying that the abstraction as such is abstract, an admirable tautology which rarely leaves Althusser's lips. But to a historian or an economist, it is, while obvious as theory, exceptionally complex in fact. It is an obviousness which can only too easily be forgotten in practice, and of which we need reminders. Moreover, Engels is not just saying that concepts and their real object are different. It is true that he overstates his case in a moment of exasperation at the old bourgeois scholastics and the new Marxist schematists on every side to science definitions are worthless. We understand his exasperation only too well but the point of his letter to Schmidt is to argue a that because all concepts are approximations, this does not make them fictions. B that only the concepts can enable us to make sense of, understand and know objective reality. C but that even in the act of knowing we can and ought to know that our concepts are more abstract and more logical than the diversity of that reality. And by empirical observation, we can know this too. We cannot understand European medieval society without the concept of feudalism, even though with the aid of this concept, we can also know that feudalism in its conceptual logic was never expressed in full classical form, which is another way of saying that feudalism is a heuristic concept which represents, corresponds to real social formations. But in the manner of all such concepts, does so in an overly purified and logical way. The definition cannot give us the real event. In any case, Engels' words are clearer than my gloss. What they come back to, as so often in these last letters, is the cry for dialectics, whose true meaning is to be found less in his attempt to reduce these to a formal code than in his practice. And an important part of this practice is exactly that dialogue between concept and evidence, which I have already discussed. Engels' second point concerns the nature of specifically historical concepts, concepts adequate to the understanding of materials which are in continuous change. Althusser exclaims against the notion that the theory of political economy is affected even in its concepts by the peculiar quality of real history, its material which is changing. 
The short answer to this is that if the real object of this knowledge is changing, and if the concepts cannot encompass the processes of change, then we will get extremely bad political economy. Not only Marxist, but orthodox bourgeois political economy had an arsenal of such concepts of change. Laws of this and that, rising and falling rates of the other, even the mobilities of supply and demand. What Althusser means to exclaim against is an irre irreverence to the fixity of categories. Engels says not only that the object changes, but that the concepts themselves must be subject to change and transformation. For Althusser, capitalism must be one thing, or another thing, or nothing. It cannot be one thing now and another thing tomorrow. And if it is one thing, then the essential categories must remain the same, however much play there may be inside them. If the categories change as the object changes according to a coefficient of mobility, then science or theory are lost. We drive among the tides of phenomena, the tides themselves moving the rudder. Um, we become, as Marx accused the students of Ranke, the valets of history. But it is not clear that Engels has set us adrift like this. The offensive words, in my view, are not concepts, are subject to change and transformation, for that may well indicate and does indicate for Engels the strenuous theoretical empirical dialogue entailed in transformation. But the preceding words, their mental reflections, and Engels may equally be signaling, and I think is signaling in his discussion of the concept feudalism, the particular flexibility of concepts appropriate in historical analysis. That is the necessary generality and elasticity of historical categories as expectations rather than as rules. I have had occasion enough to observe in my own practice that if a category as generous as the working class is improperly hardened by theoreticians to correspond to a particular historical moment of class presence and an ideal moment at that, then it very soon gives false and disastrous, disastrous historical political results. And yet without the elastic category of class and expectation justified by evidence, I could not have practiced at all. So that I think that Engels is talking good sense, that Althusser had misrepresented him and is talking no sense at all. But nevertheless, it is true that a real problem remains. We cannot just say that Engels is right and Althusser wrong. Althusser has misstated the problem, but at least we may admit that he has pointed to the area where the problem lies. The problem concerns from one aspect the differing modes of analysis of structure and of process, and from another aspect the status of political economy, and hence the status of capital. We will take it from the second aspect first. We must commence at once by agreeing that capital is not a work of history. There's a history of the development of the forms of capital inscribed within it, but this is rarely developed within the historical discipline or tested by the procedures of historical logic. The historical passages are something more than instances and illustrations, but something less than the real history. We will explain this more fully in a moment. But we must say at once that Marx never pretended, when writing Capital, that he was writing the history of capitalism. This is well known, but we will offer reminders. Marx hopes, as is apparent from the Grundry's notebooks, that his work would also offer the key to the understanding of the past, a work in its own right, which, it is to be hoped, we shall be able to undertake as well. This hope was not fulfilled. The work which was completed was that described to La Salle in 1858 as a critique of the economic categories or the system of bourgeois economy critically presented and it dealt, he told Kugelman, with capital in general. The first volume contains what the English call the principles of political economy and its title was Capital, a Critique of Political Economy. One way of proceeding may be to stand back from the structure for a moment and inquire what kind of structure it is First, we must note that some part of the power of the work comes not from its explicit procedures and from its discourse of its object, but from choices as to values and their vigorous and relevant expression, 
which could not possibly be deduced from the conceptual procedures themselves, and which are not the object of study. That is, Marx does not only lay bare the economic processes of exploitation, but he also expresses or presents his material so as to evoke indignation at suffering, poverty, child labor, waste of human potentialities, and contempt for intellectual mystifications and apologetics. I comment on this neither to commend it nor to condemn it, although the relevance may appear later. Since Marx's choice of values could be justified only with reference to a region which Althusser curtly dismisses as ideology, we might have to explain, even condone it, as a vestige of bourgeois moralism, even humanism. Certainly no such vestiges appear with Althusser and Balabar. When they have bred capital, it, is, it has been disinfested of all this. We may or we may not prefer the first to the second reading of Capital. The point is that in this significant respect, they are different books. Second, it may follow from this, and I think it does so follow, that if we disinfest Capital in this way of all moralistic intrusions, a very considerable part of that work, the major part, could be taken just as what the English call the principles of political economy. An analytic critique of the existing science and an exposition of an alternative science of economic functions, relations, and laws. That is, if we did not, for exterior reasons of value, disapprove of exploitation, waste, and suffering, then we would find ourselves presented with an alternative, laud structure of economic relations. To be true, the reader whose interests lay with capital would find its conclusions pessimistic, for the system is presented as moving rapidly towards a final crisis, which is not yet eventuated. This could not afford any scientific reasons for disagreement. These two considerations are not introduced for moralistic purposes. They help us to take a sighting of capital within the intellectual context of its moment of genesis. And they remind us that the notions of structure and of system were not inventions of Marx, although one might suppose so from some contemporary statements. We had, as is well known in 18th century Britain, very marvelous structures, the admiration of the world and the envy of the French. In particular, the constitutional structures were exemplary and had perhaps been provided to the British by God. Britain's matchless constitution mixed of mutual checking and supporting powers, kings, lords, and commons. Or in the familiar clockwork analogy as employed by William Blackstone, thus every branch of our civil polity supports and is supported, regulates and is regulated by the rest. Like three distinct powers in mechanics, they jointly impel the, the machine of government in a direction different from what either acting by itself would have done. God, as Bacon had pointed out, worked by second causes. <clears throat> and these causes, whether in nature, in psychology, or in the Constitution, often appeared as sets of interacting causes, structures. The sets that mechanical materialism proposed followed the paradigm of the clock, or of the mill. The Constitutional set was governed by the rule of law, but bourgeois political economy, from Adam Smith forward, discovered a different set, seen now more as a natural process, whose nexus was the market, where intersecting self-interests were mediated under the government of that market's laws. By the time that Marx confronted it, this political economy had become, by way of Malthus, Ricardo, and the utilitarians, a very sophisticated structure indeed, rigorous in its procedures and inclusive in its claims. Marx identified this structure as his major antagonist, and he bent the whole energies of his mind to confounding it. For nearly 20 years, this was his major preoccupation. He had to enter into each one of the categories of political economy, fracture them, and restructure them. We can see the evidences of these encounters in the Grundrisse notebooks of 1857-58, to 58, and it is customary to admire their exhaustive ardor. And I do so admire them, but I cannot altogether admire them, for they are evidences also that Marx was caught in a trap, the trap baited by political economy. 
or more accurately, he had been sucked into a theoretical whirlpool. <clears throat> and however manfully he beats his arms and swims against the circulating currents, he slowly revolves around a vortex which threatens to engulf him. Value, capital, labor, money, value, reappear again and again, are interrogated, recategorized, only to come round once more on the revolving currents in the same old forms for the same interrogation. Nor am I even being able to agree that it had to be like this, that Marx's thought could only have been developed in this way. When one considers the philosophical breakthrough of the 1840s and the propositions which inform the German ideology and communist manifesto, there would appear to be indications of stasis and even regression in the next 15 years. Despite the significance of the economic encounter in the Grand Race, and despite the rich hypotheses which appear in its interstices, as to pre-capitalist formations, etc., there is something in Marx's encounter with political economy which is obsessive. For what was this political economy? It did not offer a total account of society or of its history, or if it pretended to do so, then its conclusions were entailed in its premises. These premises proposed that it was possible not only to identify particular activities as economic, but to isolate these as a special field of study from the other activities, political, religious, legal, moral, as the area of norms and values was then defined, cultural, etc. Where such isolation proved to be impossible, as in the impingement of politics or law upon economic activity, then such impingement might be seen as improper interference with natural economic process, or as second order problems, or as the fulfillment of economic goals by other means. It might also be proposed, although not necessarily, that economics and with Malthus demography were first order problems, and that these determined or in a free state should and would determine social development as a whole. These underlay the elaborate superstructures of civilization, determining the wealth of nations and the pace and direction of progress. Thus isolated economic activities became the object of a science whose primary postulates were interests and needs, self-interest at a micro level, <coughs> the interests of groups, agriculture and industry, or even of classes, labor and capital, at a macro level, the groups and classes being defined according to the economic premises of the science. To develop such a science with rigor demanded accurate definition and fixity of categories, a mathematical logic, and the continuous internal circulation and recognition of its own concepts. Its conclusions were acclaimed as laws. This is the structure of political economy, from the outside in the 1840s, it appeared to Marx as ideology, or worse, apologetics. He entered within it in order to overthrow it. But once inside, however many of its categories he fractured, and how many times, the structure remained. For the premises supposed that it was possible to isolate economic activities in this way, and to develop these as a first-order science of society. It is more accurate to say that Marx at the time of the Grand Race did not so much remain within the structure of political economy as developed an awe, restru an awe restructure, but within its same premises. The postulates ceased to be the self-interest of men and became the logic and forms of capital to which men were subordinated. Capital was disclosed not as the benign donor of benefits, but as the appropriator of surplus value or surplus labor factional interests were disclosed as antagonistic classes, and contradiction displaced the sum progress. But what we have at the end is not the overthrow of political economy, but another political economy. Insofar as Marx's categories were anti-categories, Marxism was marked at a critical stage in its development by the categories of political economy, the chief of which was the notion of the economic as a first order activity capable of isolation in this way as the object of a science giving rise to laws whose operation would override second order activities. And there is another mark also which it, it is difficult to identify without appearing to be absurd. But the absurdities to which this error has been taken in the work of Althusser and his colleagues, 
that is, the absurdities of a certain kind of static, self-circulating Marxist structuralism, enable us to risk the ridicule. There is an important sense in which the movement of Marxist thought in the Grand Reis is locked inside a static, anti-historical structure. When we recall that Marx and Engels ceaselessly ridiculed the pretensions of bourgeois economy to disclose fixed and eternal laws independent of historical specificity, when we recall the movement within the structure, the accumulation of capital, the declining rate of profit, and when we recall that Marx sketched, even in the Grand Reis, capital in terms of the development of its historical forms, then the proposition seems absurd. After all, Marx and Engels enabled historical materialism to be born, and yet the proposition has force. For once capital has merged on the page, its self-development is determined by the innate logic inherent within the category, and the relations so entailed in much the same way as the market operates within bourgeois political economy, and still does so within some modernization theory today. Capital is an operative category which laws its own development. Hmm. And capitalism is the effect in social formations of these laws. <sighs> this mode of analysis must, nece must necessarily be anti-historical, since the actual history can only be seen as the expression of ulterior laws and historical evidence, or contemporary empirically derived evidence will then be seen as Althusser sees it, as instances or illustrations confirming these laws. But when capital and its relations are seen as a structure in a given moment of capital's forms, then this structure has a categorical stasis. That is, it can allow for no impingement of any influence from any other region, any region not allowed for it in the terms and discourse of this discipline, which can modify its relations, for this would threaten the integrity and fixity of the categories themselves. This is an extraordinary mode of thought to find in a materialist, for capital has become idea which unfolds itself in history. We remember so well Marx's imprecations against idealism and his claims to have inverted Hegel that we do not allow ourselves to see what is patently there. In the grand race, and not once or twice, but in the whole mode of presentation, we have examples of unreconstructed Hegelianism. Capital posits conditions in accordance with its imminent essence. Reminding us that Marx had studied Hegel's philosophy of nature and had noted of the idea as nature that reality is posited with imminent determinateness of form. Capital posits this and that, creates this and that, and if we are to conceive of capitalism, the inner construction of modern society, it can only be as capital in the, in the totality of its relations. It is true that Marx reminds us it is true sorry it is true that Marx reminds us or is he reminding himself that the new forces of production and relations of production of capital do not develop out of nothing nor from the womb of the self-positing idea but he goes on immediately to add well in the complicated bourgeois system every economic relation presupposes every other in its bourgeois economic form and everything posited is thus also a presupposition. This is the case with every organic system. This organic system itself as a totality has its presuppositions and its development to its totality <clears throat> consists precisely in subordinating all elements of society to itself or in creating out of it the organs which it still lacks. The organic system is then its own subject and it is this anti-historical stasis or closure which I have been indicating. The it inside this organism is capital, the soul of the organ, and it subordinates all elements of society to itself and creates out of society its own organs. The point is not only that in the light of this kind of lapse, Engels's warnings to Schmidt are necessary and salutary. Concepts and economic laws have no reality except as approximation. Did feudalism ever correspond to its to its concepts. There's a point of greater importance, for Marx has moved across an invisible conceptual line from capital, an abstraction of political economy which is his proper concern, to capitalism, the complicated bourgeois system, 
that is the whole society, conceived of as an organic system. But the whole society comprises many activities and relations of power, of consciousness, sexual, cultural, normative, which are not the concern of political economy, which have been defined out of political economy and for which it has no terms. Therefore, political economy cannot show capitalism as capital in the totality of its relations. It has no language or terms to do so, or to do this. Only a historical materialism which could bring all activities and relations within a coherent view could do this. And in my view, subsequent historical materialism has not found this kind of organism, working out its own self-fulfillment with inexorable idealist logic. Nor has it found any society which can be simply described as capital in the totality of its relations. We have never let it get so far as that, even fascism, which might be offered as its most ferocious manifestation, would then have to be glossed as an expression of its irrationality, not of its inherent rational logic. But historical materialism has found that Marx had a most profound intuition, an intuition which in fact preceded the Grand Reis, that the logic of capitalist process has found expression within all the activities of a society and exerted a determining pressure upon its development and form. Hence, entitling us to speak of capitalism or of capitalist societies, but this is a very different conclusion, a critically different conclusion, which gives us an organ organicist structuralism on one side, ultimately an idea of capital unfolding itself and a real historical process on the other. This is only a part of the grand race, of course, and of course Marx conceived of himself pugnaciously as a materialist. In his introduction, he vindicated his method of proceeding from abstractions to the concrete in thought, and his method was largely vindicated in the results. Only by the fiercest abstraction could he crack those categories apart. But he also discounted in cavalier fashion the inherent dangers of the method. Hegel went astray because, proceeding by this method, he fell into the illusion of conceiving the real as the product of thought unfolding itself out of itself. It seemed so easy to cast this silly illusion aside, but to proceed by much the same method. But if Marx never forgot that thought was not self-generating, but was a product, rather, of the working up of observation and conception into concepts, this mode of abstraction could still give him, on occasion, capital as the unfolding of its own idea. I think that for 10 years, Marx was in this trap. His delays, his carbuncles, cannot all be attributed to the bourgeoisie. When he came to write capital, the trap had been in some part sprung. <clears throat> I am not expert enough to describe his partial self-deliverance, but I would suggest four considerations. First, the trap was never fully closed. Marx had conceived of capitalism in historical terms in the 1840s, continued to do so by fits and starts in the Grand Reis, and these were also years in which applied and concrete political analysis continued to flow from his pen. Second, and alongside this, he continued to develop not only in his historical but also in his practical political experience. As a historical actor in his own part, and in observing the growth, flux, and recession of working-class struggles in Europe. These two considerations are self-evident. The other two may be more controversial. For the third, I would emphasize, once again, the important influence of the origin of species. I am aware that my admiration for Darwin is regarded as an amiable or guilty eccentricity, and that there is a general mindset among progressive intellectuals which attributes to Darwin the sins of teleological evolutionism, positivism, social Malthusianism, and apologias for exploitation, the survival of the fittest, and of racism. But I am not convinced of these objections, and to be honest, I am not even convinced that all these critics have read The Origin of Species, nor read informed scientific evaluations of it. I know very well how Darwin's ideas were put to use by others, and I also know of his subsequent rather few lapses. But what is remarkable in his work is the way in which he argues through rigorously and in an empirical mode, the logic of evolution, which is not a teleology, 
whose conclusions are not entailed in their premises, but which is still subject to rational explanation. In any case, my admiration, whether innocent or not, was certainly shared by Engels and Marx. Marx read the book in December 1860 and at once wrote to Engels. Although it is developed in this crude English style, this is the book which contains the basis in natural history for our view. To La Salle, he wrote in the next month, the book is very important and serves me as a basis in natural science for the class struggle in history. Despite all deficiency, not only is the death blow dealt here for the first time to teleology in the natural sciences, but the rational meaning is empirically explained. There are two important recognitions here. First, Marx recognized grudgingly that the empirical method, however crude, however English, had adduced a substantial contradiction or contribution to knowledge. Second, Marx recognized in the non-teleological explication of a rational logic and natural process, a basis for our view, indeed a basis in natural science for the class struggle in history. There's surely a recognition here that this basis had not been provided before in the Grand Race, and even the suggestion that Marx was aware that his abstractionist mode of procedure was not proof against such teleology. It is not that Marx supposed that Darwinian analogies could be taken unreconstructed from the animal to the human world. He very soon reproved a correspondent who, with the aid of Malthus, was supposing that. It is rather a question of method in which Darwin's work was taken as exemplar of the rational explication of the logic of process, which in new terms must be developed in historical practice. And I cannot see that we have any license to pass this off as some momentary fancy. Still in 1873, Marx took the trouble to send Darwin a copy of Capital inscribed by him as a gift from his sincere admirer. It is at this time, 1860, that the work of fashioning the Grand Race into Capital commenced. And this leads me to my fourth consideration. It appears to me that Marx was more self-critical of his earlier work than many commentators allow. I will not delay to puzzle over the various hints that survive as to his own self-dissatisfaction, but in my view the writing of Capital involved a radical restructuring of his materials in ways partly influenced by the origin of species. It is argued, for example, that by Martin Nicholas, the editor of the Grand Race, that the changes may be attributed to Marx's desire to make his work more popular, more concrete, and hence more widely available to the revolutionary movement. But the inner structure of capital is identical in, in the main lines to the Grand Race. In the first, the method is visible. In capital, it is deliberately, consciously hidden. I do not think so. And I think even less of the attempt to explain away Marx's letter to Engels, August 15, 1863, in which he writes of the slow progress of capitals and explains that he has had to turn everything round as meaning that he had to overthrow virtually all of previous political economy. The phrase is this, when I look at this compilation now and see how I have to turn everything round and how I had to make even the historical part out of material of which some was quite unknown. And I cannot bear this construction. The overthrow of previous political economy had been done already in the notebooks of 1857 to 58. What was new was the historical part and the turning around of the rest. This turning around, I am arguing, involved not only adding a historical dimension to the work and much greater concrete exemplification derived from empirical investigation, but also attempting to bring under control and reduce to the rational explication of process, the idealist, even self-fulfilling teleological formulations derived from the abstractionist mode what comes into capital in a new way is a sense of history and a, con and a concretion of exemplification accompanied, we recall, by extraneous expressions of wrath. And yet Nicolaus is not wholly wrong in some part, and that part specifically the anti-structure of political economy, the structure of capital remains that of the Grand Ries. It remains a study of the logic of capital, not of capitalism, and the social and political dimensions of the history, the wrath, and the understanding of the class struggle arise from a region independent of the closed system of economic logic. 
in that sense, capital was and probably had to be a product of theoretical miscegen- fuck, miscegenation. But miscegenation of this order is no more possible in theory than in the animal kingdom, for we cannot leap across the fixity of categories or of species, so that we are forced to agree with seven generations of critics. Capital is a mountainous inconsistency. As pure political economy it may be faulted for introducing external categories, its laws cannot be verified and its predictions were wrong. As history or as sociology, it is abstracted to a model which has heur heuristic value, but which follows two obsequiously ahistorical economic laws. Capital was not an exercise of a different order to that of mature bourgeois political economy, but a total confrontation within that order. As such, it is both the highest achievement of political economy and it signals the need for its supersession by historical materialism. To say the former is not to diminish Mar Marx's achievement, for it is only in the light of that achievement that we are able to make this judgment. But the achievement does not produce historical materialism. It provides the preconditions for its production. A unitary knowledge of society, which is always in motion, hence a historical knowledge, cannot be won from a science which, as a presupposition of its discipline, isolates certain kinds of activity only for study and provides no categories for others. And the structure of capital remains marked by the categories of his antagonistic, notably econom economy itself. In this sense, it is true that in capital, history is introduced to provide exemplification and illustration for a structure of theory which is not derived from this discipline. However, reluctantly, we must go halfway towards the positions of Althusser and Balabar. But we need not go all the way, for these illustrations would have been of no value if they were wrong, snatched from history's received accounts, and not both researched. I had to make even the historical part out of material of which some was quite unknown and interrogated in new ways. It is more true to say that the history in capital and in attendant writings is immensely fruitful as hypothesis, and yet as hypothesis which calls in question again and again the adequacy of the categories of political economy. We find here a veritable cornucopia of hypotheses informed by consistent theoretical propositions, the determining pressures of the mode of production. Hypotheses which historical materialism has been setting to work ever since. But setting them to work has not involved only testing them or verifying them. It has also entailed revising and replacing them. Even Marx's more elaborated historical hypotheses, for example, as to the struggle to lengthen the working day, or as to the enclosure movement in England, and its relation to labor supply for industry, as well as his more cryptic or more complex hypotheses, for example, as to the transition from feudalism to capitalism, or as to the British bourgeois revolution, or as to oriental despotism and the Asiatic mode of production, have always undergone in historical materialism's own discourse of the proof, either reformation or very much more radical change. How could it be otherwise? To suppose differently would be to suppose not only that everything can be said at once, but that imminent theory or knowledge found its miraculous embodiment in Marx. Not fully mature, to be sure, it had yet to develop to Althusser's full stature, but already perfectly formed and justly proportioned in all its parts. This is a fairy story recited to children in Soviet primary classes and not even believed by them. Capital Volume 1 is rich in historical hypotheses. Volume two and three are less so. The anti-structure of political economy narrows once again. Marx's hope of himself developing historical materialism in practice remained very largely unfulfilled. It was left to the old clown, Frederick Engels, to make some attempts to remedy that. And his essay in historical anthropology, The Origin of the Family, Darwin's influence again, is generally taken by Marxist anthropologists today to exemplify the infancy rather than the maturity of their knowledge. In his final years, Engels looked around in alarm and noted the gathering consequences of their great omission. There are many allusions to the theory of historical materialism and capital 
he wrote to Bloch in 1890. And Marx hardly wrote anything in which it did not play a part. But he wrote nothing in which it played a leading part, and Bloch was directed to Anti During and Ludwig Feuerbach as the places in which might be found the most detailed account of historical materialism, which, so far as I know, exists. And in the same year, to Conrad Schmidt, all history must be studied afresh. The conditions of existence of the different formations of society must be individually examined before the attempt is made to deduce from them the political, civil, legal, aesthetic, philosophic, religious, etc. notions corresponding to them. Only a little has been done here up to now. It is sobering to reflect upon how many human activities, for none of which political economy afforded categories, are comprised within this sentence, but Engels was in an increasingly sober mood. Too many of the younger Germans simply make use of the phrase historical materialism, and everything can be turned into a phrase in order to get their relatively scanty historical knowledge, for economic history is still in its cradle, fitted together into a neat system as quickly as possible, and then they think themselves something very tremendous. So that not only historical materialism, but the region of it most immediately proximate to capital, economic history, Engels could see to be still in its cradle, and now seemed to him, with gathering urgency, that what was wrong with Marx's uncompleted life work, capital, was that it was not historical enough. To Mehring in 1893, there is only one other point lacking, which, however, Marx and I always fail to stress enough in our writings and in regard to which we are all equally guilty. We all, that is to say, lead, and we're bound to lay the main emphasis at first on the derivation of political, juridical, and other ideological notions, and of the actions arising through the medium of these notions from basic economic facts. But in so doing, we neglected the formal side, the way in which these notions come about for the sake of the content. It is the old story, Engels continued, form is always neglected at first for content. But this failure had given purchase to the criticisms of the ideologists with their fatuous notion that because we deny an independent historical development to the various ideological spheres which play a part in history, we also deny them any effect in history. The basis of this is the common undialectical conception of cause and effect as rigidly opposed as rigidly opposite poles, the total disregarding of interaction. The letters are familiar, and it may be wondered why I rehearse them. I do this now to emphasize, first, that Engels clearly acknowledged that Marx had assumed a theory of historical materialism, which he had neither fully posed nor begun to develop. For some part of its proposition, we are indeed dependent upon Engels's late letters. Althusser ridicules these letters, but we should note a curiosity in the fact that he can, in the same moment, borrow notions, relative autonomy in the last instance determination, of central importance to his thought from passages which lie cheek by jowl, in the same letters which he lampoons. I will add that these letters were as familiar to me as and to fellow practitioners in historical materialism in 1948 as in 1978, and that this was there, and this was where we started from. We did not have to wait up upon Althusser to learn that the critical problems lay in the area of relative autonomy, etc. These phrases pointed towards the problems which we then set out in our practice to examine. I will come back to this question since it indicates a very different Marxist tradition from that of Althusser. The second reason for rehearsing these letters is that we find in them that Engels is, as I think, correctly indicating the area of the largest and most dangerous and ambiguous of the real silences left by Marx's death, and shortly to be sealed by his own. But in the same moment, in the very terms in which he discusses this absent theory, he reveals the inadequacy of its terms. For political, juridical, and other ideological notions cannot be derived from economic facts within a discourse of political economy so exacting that its very definitions of the economic affords to these extraneous evidences no entry, and the notion that the concepts of Marxism should be historical categories and subject to change and transformation would play havoc 
with the credentials of Marxism as an exact science of the capitalist mode of production. So that Engels is saying, in effect, that historical materialism and Marxist political economy have failed to find a common junction and a theoretical vocabulary capable of encompassing both process and structure. That Marxism is in danger of becoming imprisoned within the categories of capital, but that the pressure of incipient historical materialism can be seen within its structures. In its inconsistencies as much as its hypotheses, which pressure he could authenticate from Marx's other work and from their long common project. He wished in these final letters to give to historical materialism a charter of liberation from the structure of the old grand race, but he could not solve the theoretical problems thus entailed, nor find the terms to do so. Subsequent historical materialism in its practice, although insufficiently in its theory, has sought to serve under this charter of liberation. Althusser and his colleagues seek to thrust historical materialism back into the prison of the categories of political economy. I think that contemporary Marxist economists are right to note that in Capital, Marx repeatedly uses the concept of the circuit of capital to characterize the structure of the capitalist economy, and more than that, of capitalist society more generally. But historical materialism, as assumed as hypothesis by Marx, and as subsequently developed in our practice, must be concerned with other circuits also, the circuits of power, of the reproduction of ideology, etc. And these belong to a different logic and to other categories. Moreover, historical analysis does not allow for static contemplation of circuits, but is immersed in moments when all systems go and every circuit sparks across the other. So that Engels is in this sense wrong it is not true that he and Marx neglected the formal side, the way in which these notions come about for the sake of the content. It was rather the overdevelopment of the formal side in the anti-structure of political economy, which in its genesis and form was derived from a bourgeois construction and which confined the real historical content into impermissible and unpassable forms. Our concern must now be to approach this problem from a different aspect, the alternative heuristics of structure and of process. But first, may we take a brief adieu of our old clown? It is now de rigueur to make old angles into a whipping boy and to impung, him, impung to him any sign that one chooses to impung to subsequent Marxisms. All this has now been written out and by many hands, and I need not go over it all again. I am willing to agree that several of the charges stick. Thus, I think it is true that in his writings, one, Engels gave credibility to epistemological reflection theory. Two, he introduced a paradigm of natural process, a misapplied Darwinism in his anthropological and historical work, which drifted towards a positive evolutionism. Three, he certainly introduced, as did with equal certainty Marx, Histori historicist notions of laud and, un and predetermined development. These are heavy charges, although I cannot accept the pleadings which always find Marx and Lenin innocent and leave Engels alone in the dock. And to these I have added my own, more marginal charges as to Engels's unfortunate and ill-considered influence in the formative British socialist movement. But when all this has been said, what an extraordinary, dedicated, and versatile man he was. How closely he followed his own times, how far he risked himself, further often than Marx, in engagements with his contemporary historical and cultural thought, how deeply and passionately he was engaged in a movement which was spreading to the five continents, how generously he gave himself in his last years to the paper of his old friend and to the incessant correspondence of the movement. If we must learn, oh sorry, if we must learn on occasion from his errors, then he would have expected this to be so, and it is, least of all, for the revisionist letters of his last decade that he is to be cast as a whipping boy. It is taken to be a truism by the young that older is worse than younger, but I cannot see that Engels exemplifies that general case. The general in his last decade did not renege upon the propositions of his youth. Rather, he dwelt nostalgically upon the salad days of the 1840s, 
and in the wisdom and foreboding of age, he noted that there was something in the young movement of the 1880s and 1890s, which was turning away from the intuitions of his and Marx's original theses. If he is to be punished, he should be punished for these late letters of qualification and of warning, least of all. That the letters proposed but did not answer, many problems can be agreed, but if the warnings had been fully attended to, then the history of Marxism might have been different. I will not allow Frederick Engels to be cast as a senile clown after all. He should be taken until his last year, as he would have wished. His great sanity, his errors, his breadth of understanding, but his excessive family possessiveness of the movement, all intermixed. <laughs>